Okay, Dave, we are back. We're back. This is not Christmas this time. We're actually doing something that's, well, it, it doesn't really matter in the season. Yeah. But uh, this, this is actually a topic I think I brought up. Oh, boy. How long ago was that? Maybe like November or December of last year. I think so, yeah. And it, it's kind of like a large undertaking that we did. I didn't think it would be this large. Yeah. And then once you start getting buried into the games, it's like, oh, my God, what? What what did I try to bite off here? This kind of impacted the uh, the progress of other things. It took <laughs> yeah. so long. Yeah, so yes. I, I don't know how much we will do like this kind of episode again because these games are so long. I, again, it doesn't mean we're going to sit here and talk for like five hours about them because, I mean, really there's not that much to cover. Yeah. But what I did was approach the subject. We were just talking in the car. I think we were going to like thrift stores or something in Iowa. Yeah. And I just started talking. I'm like, Dave, like, you ever play Fire Emblem? <laughs> and you're like, no. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't know Dave, he's a huge, like, RPG and strategy fan. Yeah. And somehow never played Fire Emblem. Weird. Strangest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. So I'm like, dude, like, I, I knew from a second, like, Dave is going to not only love Fire Emblem, but it's probably going to be one of those things he dives into and you don't find him for like yeah, a year it, down the road. It's going to be a rabbit hole that, yeah, and, and and it still is a rabbit hole I have not plumbed the depths of yet. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I was thinking close. like, okay, like, <laughs> is Fire Emblem 1 and 2, is that really enough to do an episode of? And like, thinking back, it's definitely it more been. than enough. It would have been. But so I was thinking, I'm like, okay, I had just started playing the uh, the uh, Shining Force games, which is also what we're going to cover, just the first two Sega Genesis ones. Yeah. And, then, and I noticed, so I'm like, I never played Shining Force before other than like, you know, months ago. And I just noticed the similarities between that and Fire Emblem. I'm like, wow, okay. So Nintendo's had Fire Emblem. And I, I've known for them to have Fire Emblem forever. But I had never played Shining Force before. And when you play them, it's like, dude, this is a very similar franchise. Mm -hmm. At at least as far as gameplay goes. Not so much as far as story and stuff, but whatever. So, uh, yeah. So I asked him, uh, now, how do you pick like which Fire Emblem games and which Shining Force games to play? And through my mind, and I don't think this is the right thing to do, thinking back on it. (laughs) But I'm thinking, I'm like, okay, well, the first two I played were the first two that came out in North America. Yeah. It was Fire Emblem on the Game Boy Advance yep. and Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, which came out like a year or two later in Game Boy Advance. Yep. And the first two Shining Force games that I know of that came out in the U.S. were Shining Force and Shining Force 2 on Sega Genesis. So I'm like, okay, there's some Famicom and Super Famicom versions of Fire Emblem, but we didn't really get them here. Mm-hmm. Not a lot of people are going to probably care or know or whatever. So I'm like, okay, how about if we just play the first two games of each franchise that came out in North America and we just kind of compare them against each other? Thinking back on it, like, you can't <laughs> really compare them because, like, one is obviously so much better than the other. Yeah, there's a huge difference. There is. So... You know, in my mind, it sounded good. It ended up being kind of dumb, but we're just kind of go with it because yeah. I mean, we played how many hours of both of these games? Absurd <laughs> like, amount of hours. Yeah, I think each one took me at least twenty. Yeah, maybe maybe Shining Force One wasn't that long, but like maybe yeah. it was. It, it was long enough, and, and all these had a lot of repeating things ordering to get good. My my perfectionism about these games got cranked up to the max. <laughs> that was my huge problem too, because yeah. I, I was thinking like, okay, I want to play these and just grind through them as fast as possible, and that like you can say that, but Easier once you start playing them, yeah, it's like ooh yeah. that that grindy RPG personality that thing comes right back out when you're playing these. Yep. Yep. So, Dave, I don't know if you just want to go over, like, the, the history. We're going to start with the Shiny Force games first. Or, I'm sorry, the Fire Emblem games first. Yeah. So, if you want to give the history of Fire Emblem. Yeah. And uh, we'll just kind of go from there. Yeah. So, this is something that I was only vaguely aware of uh, up till doing this episode uh, because of the characters that showed up in Smash Brothers. And I never really, I was aware they were a series of games that was mostly in Japan, but I just, I thought I'd, I'd delve into it because this is interesting to me. And so this started out in April of 1990 on the Famicom. We got Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon, and the Blade of Light, um, which was later remade as Fire Emblem, Shadow Dragon on the DS. Which and I've came always out heard everywhere. that's kind of like the, the redheaded stepchild of the Game Boy games, but I haven't, I haven't delved into it yet yeah i mean it it, will get into in a sec because it's a little weird but this is the game that uh started with prince marth of altea fighting 
against evil sorcerer Garneth and his dark master, the shadow dragon. Um, Marth is, you know, the kind of, you could say he's the OG Fire Emblem hero, basically. He's probably the one that people know the most, yeah. at least from, like, Smash Bros., which is probably most of the people that know from Fire Emblem or whatever. Yeah, and, and this wasn't by any means the first console, uh, you know, a tactical RPG, but it might have been the one that most laid the groundwork for the genre, that most defined the genre. It, you know, kind of pulled in some concepts from Dragon Quest, um, some of the Advance War style games and, and things like that. Uh, I believe there was some of those for the Famicom as well. Uh, but, uh, so you had that, and then you had, uh, Fire Emblem Gaiden, which also came out on the Famicom, uh, a couple years later in 92. And, um, to my knowledge, uh, only came out in, uh, this side of the fence, uh, as Fire Emblem Echoes Shadows of Valencia on the 3DS, uh, in 2017. So that's how long that took. Oh, is that what that one was? Yeah. Uh, although it did, it has, it has had a fan translation since 2009 or so. Okay. Cause I'm going to say, I'm actually like probably two thirds of the way through that game on the 3DS. Yeah. And that one features, uh, Prince Alm and Princess Celia of Valencia. Yep. Uh, again, you know, not, not the most famous characters. I don't think they've been in any Smash Brothers or anything. I would say, too, like, out of the games, those are not the most exciting ones either. Yeah. Just FYI. So those are the two NES games. Uh, neither one of them showed up anywhere uh, around here outside of Japan, uh, uh, for Intel, these re re releases. Then you get to the Famicom, or the Super Famicom, rather, uh, and you got Fire Emblem Mystery of the Emblem in 94. Um, that one again had a fan translation in 2009, but was remade as Fire Emblem New Mystery of the Emblem on the DS in 2010. Um, See, I've never even heard of that. Only one. in Japan. Okay, so, that's why. <laughs> so again, and the, the weird thing about this one is this one, to the best of my knowledge, is a remake of the original NES game. Uh, but also has a new sequel story uh, featuring Prince Marth. Okay. Uh, so this is. Uh, so this game, you have the the original Famicom release that was remade as a DS game, and then you have the remake on the Famicom, which was apparently also remade on the DS, <laughs> but I think with some more content. And so if there are people that don't like Shadow Dragon, uh, I'd have to play this and Shadow Dragon on the DS, but I would suspect this might be the more robust version. Yeah, so much to catch up to do, Dave. <laughs> I do. It's That's what I'm saying. This is a rabbit hole. I got to play a lot of games. But uh, then we go on to Fire Emblem Genealogy of the Holy War, also on the Super Famicom in 1996. Jeez, that's a late one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, featuring Prince Sigurd and his son Salif of Granville uh, against the Cult of the Dragon Loptuus. Lop, 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 lop uh, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Uh, that one had a fan translation in 2016 and nothing else as far as I know. Uh, again, I, I should say uh, most or all these games I think came out on the virtual console, so I'm omitting that in my description oh, okay. here. Um, after that, you get Fire Emblem Thracia 776, which came out in 1999 on For the what? Super Famicom. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to get an idea of how That's popular crazy. these games are in Japan. <laughs> 1999 on the Super Famicom. Is that like uh, PlayStation era or something? Yeah. Like Wow. Basically, yeah. Um, with a so that one had a fan translation in 2019, I believe. Uh, that one featured uh, Prince Leaf of Thracia against the Grand Vale Empire. Uh, this is basically a set during a second generation timeline of the the previous uh, game, I believe. Um, of uh, I think the genealogy, of the Holy War game, I believe. Um, See, so, no, I think actually, I, I first probably heard of Fire Emblem. On from Super Famicom, like I, some magazines would have like a mention of it, but yeah, I never, I had never played any of them until the Game Boy ones came out. Yeah, sorry, yeah, because this I think these two games kind of one you were playing the 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 protagonist of one empire or of one of one of one kingdom that then kind of turned to evil or turned to you oh, know okay. starts became an empire, and then you're. You're fighting now uh, uh, a different kingdom that's now oppressed by that empire. So it's kind of an interesting oh, that's, that's multi generation okay. thing. That's the 1999 one. That's the Thracia seven seven six in that was made in 1999. Rolls right yes. off the tongue. Okay. Yes, yes. 
And so that's the that's those five games are kind of the the original. This is the Japan only stuff. Yeah. Barely barely anyone in the U.S. has has seen or heard of other than you know you, you might have heard of Fire Emblem, but that's about it. You might have imported a cart, you know that sort of thing. Or or like when did Smash Bros. come out? That was probably ninety eight or ninety. Well, that's kind of what we're getting to. Sure. So the next one we have is Fire Emblem: The Binding Blade on the GBA. So this was still Japan only. Um, with a fan translation in 2013. This one features Prince Roy of Ferrey, okay. the son of Eliwood, which was the game, one of the games oh, we Eliwood, played. Yeah, uh, yeah. Eliwood, Eliwood, whatever. Um, against uh, King Zephiel of Bern. You might remember uh, him from playing the game. So this is basically set a generation after the sequel, Fire Emblem, The Blazing Blade. Uh, so Roy was, uh, the Roy would show up in Smash Brothers. Roy and Marth are the two the original ones that showed up in Smash Brothers. I yep. believe they showed up in the first Smash Brothers game, I believe. No, 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 or, no. Or, sorry, the first um the first one after this. The, the melee on GameCube. Yeah. Game. Yes. Um so yeah, this you know the, the yeah the GBA and the GameCube, you know, kind of the Oh duh, I was getting those mixed up. When I said nineteen ninety nine, like when did the GameCube even come out? You know, like, yeah, this this I, came I got out it mixed up. But... This came out in two thousand two. Um, oh, yeah. And so, yeah, this is that area where you have the GBA <laughs> yeah. and the GameCube, you know, kind of synced up and some of the games kind of talk to each other. Some of them, you know, you had the Fire Fa- Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles and some of those things. So I think the, uh, a big part of this was Nintendo trying to take these characters that were popular and, and, they, and you know, as they were bringing out this GBA game, let's also feature them on the GameCube in the ter- in the form of Smash Bros. You know, I will say very successful because, yeah. yes. you know, yes. I saw them on there and I'm like, Dude, I want to play Fire Emblem. Marth and Roy are cool as shit. Like, yeah. where do I get more of them? Exactly. And so I think, based on my understanding of this, the popularity of those two in Smash Brothers, along with the success of Advance Wars on the GBA. Which I love, by the way. Yeah. Great, great series. The two of those things together, is my understanding, is what caused them to release the next game, the seventh game in the series. <laughs> the Fire, one we finally got. Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade as just Fire Emblem... Yeah, not uh, to confuse here. anyone. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So they didn't release it as the Blazing Blade here. They just released it as Fire Emblem on the GBA. And so that came out in 2003. So seven games in, we're finally in America. We're finally seeing this or, you know, elsewhere other than Japan. Um, so that that's the first entry that was released worldwide. And, and this is after games like Shining Force, Ogre Battle, Final, Final Fantasy Tactics, yep. Dizagaya, uh, etc. Yeah, so, did Tactics actually come out first? I believe Before so, that? yes. That's in my research. I believe that came out in, uh, you'd have to look up exactly when, but uh, those were all games that were already out when this came out. Um, because like, uh, the Tactics for me was one that like, I, yeah, 97, wow. Yeah. Yeah, Tactics was one of those where it's like I always meant to play it. And yes. it took me I think the first Tactics game I played was the GBA one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really need which to is play excellent, by the I way. need to play more of those as well. You, you want to spend forty hours on a game, <laughs> like talk about eighty. That's, that's the that's thing. about what it is. That, yeah. That's the thing, yeah. It's you really have to set aside the time. You will hate yourself. There's yeah. so much grinding, it's ridiculous. So yeah, this game featured Prince Eliwood, Al- Eliwood, what have you, a fairy. I always call him Eliwood. Eliwood. I don't know why. Maybe yeah. it's Eli Wood. Eli Wood, Eli Wood. Which sounds yeah. so stupid. Uh, also, Prince Hector of Ostia and Princess oh. Lynn of Kaelin yep. against Nurgle and the Black Fang. Uh, then you got uh, Fire Emblem the Sacred Stones, which came out in 2004 uh, in Japan and 2005 in USA. I'm not sure why the the break the, the break up there, but yeah, translation, yeah, whatever. translation probably. Uh, the other one I think came out worldwide at the same time, so that's what was confusing to me. But this mm. this one f- featured uh, Prince Ephraim and Princess Erica of Renes against the Grado Empire. And so those last two, five, seven and eight, uh, those are the ones that we, we're playing today, uh, or we play, we're discussing today. But it kept going, obviously. We got Fire Emblem Path of Radiance in uh, 2005 on the GameCube. Is that really the third game that came out in the U.S.? I believe so. Holy shit. Yeah. Okay. That one was released on the GameCube. Um I think it was just uh, April and October of 2005. By the way, I think I got that one on launch day because uh, I was so looking forward to it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I have to play more Fire Emblem. And that uh, featured Prince Ike of Crimea. Yep. Ike, who would later show up in Smash Brothers. So that's the, the that third. That game is excellent. The third one that shows up in a later Smash. I believe he showed up in the uh, the the uh, the one on the GameCube. Is, or is it the, the one for the, the Wii? Uh, that was the Wii one. Yeah, I believe it was the Wii one. Um, so you got Ike. Uh, you got Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn, 
uh, which was released in 2007 on the Wii. And it's one of those few like decent full fledged Wii games that yeah. doesn't feel like crap. Yeah, and that features Princess uh, Mac- uh was it Makaya Makaya of Dalen Dan against the the Begnian Empire. I think this is. I don't even know why you're trying to pronounce yeah. them. <laughs> one, one, <laughs> it of the, matter. one of the lesser known protagonists, I think. Yeah. Uh, except um, this one apparently included characters from the previous game, and you could transfer data from the previous game to give oh, improved stats to characters. Oh. So apparently there's some reason, you know, the Wii is basically a GameCube, right? So it's there's some reason to play both of those together. Sure. Well, apparently. yeah, you could put it in your memory card or whatever, right. and I'm sure it did something. I yep. didn't know that. Yep. I, I think when I played on the Wii one, I played like a burned disc that I, you know, yeah. I had a modded Wii, so that's how I did it at the time, but... Right. I don't remember anything about the Wii one other than the fact that, like, I remember it was decent. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's about all I can get out of it. Yeah. So you might want to play those two together if you haven't played either. That's probably yeah. what I'm going to do. Uh, then you get Fire Emblem Awakening, which came yep. out in 2012 and 2013. This is a super good game. On the, on the 3DS. Yep. And that features Prince Krom of Elis, I guess, against the Risen and the Nation of Plagia. I never remember the stories for any of these games because like yeah. they're almost always the same thing. And so this is another suite of characters, uh, three of them, Krom, Lucina, and Robin all later showed up in Smash Bros., I yep. believe the 3DS version. Uh, then you get Fire Emblem Fates, which came out in 2015 and 2016 on the 3DS. With Prince or Princess Corin, I think the first character that could be either male or female. So this this was Fates and Conquest, right? Did those get released at the same time? Um, that might be why I don't recall that part. I just I just had it uh, listed as Fire Emblem Fates. I haven't played it yet, obviously. Is, it was the next one, Conquest. Uh, no, I don't see that one written down. Okay, well, what else? Of- either that or I'm not familiar with it. But okay, one of them came out as like a almost like a Pokemon deal where like two games came out at the same time, but that they might be. they basically covered each side of the story instead of just buying one game that covered both of them. Yeah. So, um, that, yeah. So this, my understanding of this one is you have Prince or princess Corin of Hoshido against one of two opposing nations. Uh-huh. And I think you, I think you have some choice about which way that goes. And Corin would later show up in smash bros. Again, you can play, I think either the male or female version of Corin. That's and I think Corin like could, uh, do like multiple different class types or whatever. Like yeah. it really had a lot of customization that yes. wasn't there previously. Yeah. M- much less of what you'd see in previous games where you have a set protagonist and that's how they are. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'd have to look up the, the multiple versions you mentioned that might just be that people just call it fates, but it yeah, I thought there was versions. a fates and the conquest who cares. Yeah. Whatever. It doesn't matter. Then you get fire emblem three houses, which is the uh, worldwide release in 2019 on the Switch, which was going to be the first game I played because uh, you know, I have pe- other people I know that that owned it and were suggesting I buy it when I yes. finally got my Switch. I'm shocked that you never have. Uh, I I, I should have. It was one. It was one of a few games I was going to pick up uh, at one point, and then just. I had, I have such a backlog of Steam games and Switch games and other things. It just didn't happen yet. Well, thankfully for you, Dave, that yeah. game is not one that ra- like rose in price because no. Fire Emblem is actually pretty popular now, so yes. like it's not hard to find them when they do come out. Yep. So that'll be interesting. That one features a uh, Byleth of the Garig <laughs> Mach, Bear, of the Garig Mach Monastery, who acts as a professor of military of the military academy, leading one of the titular three houses. Byleth, again, shows up in Smash Bros. You may have noticed a theme. They're pretty much bringing almost all the characters after a certain point into Smash Bros. That became a major gripe of Smash yes. Bros. It became yes. like a meme at one point. It's yes. just like, all right, which Fire Emblem character is <laughs> coming out? Let's take a wild guess. Like, and, and that was what was interesting to me. Like, people got so worked up about this. I'm like, but this has to be ridiculously popular in Japan for I'm them sure to care. sure Yeah, cl- clearly, you know, they had the <laughs> sure five games is. before we ever heard of it. Uh, and then finally, you get Fire Emblem Engage, which came out in, tw- in 2023, just in January of this year, I believe, on the Switch, yep. uh, which features the divine dragon Altir or Alir of Lyros against the corrupted in the kingdom of Lusia. And my understanding is that one brings in characters from the previous games, like in the form of spirits or something along those lines. Like you channel these other characters. I have not played it. I have not played either. It's I, I've heard good and bad things. I think mostly good, but yeah, I'll buy it at some point. But like, yeah. I have such a backlog, it's not even worth it right now. So yeah, we're up to fourteen Fire Emblem games. Jesus Christ. That's how much of a backlog of games I have to get through. <laughs> See, at least I've gotten through most of them. Obviously, yeah. not the Japanese only ones. I haven't like those will be a while down the road, but. 
Yeah. Yeah, I, I think as far as games go, I only have like Shadow Dragon, I think, to really play. Yeah, and so one thing, I, one other thing I did do after we played these two GBA games is I went and played a little bit the NES game and the uh, one of the the uh, game on the uh, Super Famicom games, and they were they held up surprisingly well. I think. I mean, these are translated versions, yeah. obviously. They, you know, obviously the 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 technology is much more uh, basic. You know, the 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 UI and everything doesn't provide as much as much information, but the gameplay is basically there. Yeah, I, they, I played all of like five minutes of one of the Super Famicom games. It's like, yeah, yeah. it's Fire Emblem kind yeah. of, but like, it's a it's a step back, obviously. Just yeah. It, it is. is, and we'll go into that when we talk about this versus Shining Force, considering that, you know, yeah, the, 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 pretty first, big step back. the first NES game came out first, then Shining Force, and some other things, and so forth, and then the second one on the NES, and then some t- somewhat later, the, Fam- <laughs> the Super Famicom games. So, you know, comparing, uh, comparing the GBA games, which are, you know, much, much later, you know, seven games down the line against the Genesis game might not be the fairest thing, but that's what we ended up it, doing. It's funny. I always forget how <laughs> much more advanced the Game Boy Advance was than, like, a Super Nintendo even at the time. Yeah, people compared it. People said this is a portable SNES, but it really was so wasn't. much better. It it's really was so wasn't. much better. <laughs> like, other than the fact that, like, the G- the GBA had, like, a shit screen at the po- at the time. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, it's hard to see it unless you have perfect, like, sunlight in front of you or whatever right other than that like man those games are so much better yeah there's there's a lot of things that they're much more in depth but so i think we should move on to the first of our games then which is uh, fire emblem the blazing blade or Or just fire Fire emblem Emblem. (laughs) on the gba Uh, yeah so so what are your thoughts on this so like i i have played this game i got this game basically when it first came out i was like hooked because i really like rpgs i really like strategy games it's a mix of both i was just like wow yeah so like as far as my first thoughts go, it's a very like linear Fire Emblem game. It's yeah. probably the most linear one you're ever gonna play. I don't, other than like the Japanese only releases, which I'm sure are much more linear. But yeah, this follows the story of. Um, now I don't even know because like the the game that I played uh, this time around, I had already beaten. Yeah, so I think I could pick and choose like which characters and which modes and stuff I wanted to start. Yeah, so you can start in Princess Lin's mode, which is kind of like the the practice mode. Yeah, essentially. it's like super easy. And it's super easy, but if you do it, then your your stats are slightly higher if you play those characters in the next mode, which is Prince Eliwood's Eliwood's mode. And then you also have the option of Prince Hector's mode, which I think you have to beat the game first to play his mode. That's what I played this time through. Okay. Yeah, and and his, so his mode is basically the same as Eliwood's mode, but from a told from a slightly different angle. So it's I think it's the same fights and the same stuff, but there's some differences in the storyline. And I can't remember; yeah. it's been so long, but. But Hector is such a boss in this game. Yeah. Yeah. Hector is <laughs> like un- pretty awesome. Ungodly just kill tank. It's interesting because most of the games have like one or sometimes two Lord characters, you know, the Lord class. Right. This game Basically has the three. Main character, but this yeah. game has three and they're all, you know, one's a little more of a Myrmidon. One's a little more of a knight. One's a little more of an axe guy, you know, a warrior type. So it's kind of interesting. Like, I, so I started on Hector's mode initially uh, because I had already beaten the game. I had the option to start it on hard mode. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, like, how hard can it be? You know, whatever. So I started playing on hard mode, and I think I got, like, 10 chapters in, and it is ungodly difficult. Yeah. It is a very much, like, you have to throw units away. Yeah. You basically have to know, like, okay, these guys are going to die. You just have to be cool with that. And we didn't even discuss that. So <laughs> Yeah, it's a good time. Classic Fire Emblem. Yeah. You, you have your party of characters. Yeah. If they die in battle, they are gone. Yeah. Just deleted from the game. You'll get a little blurp at the end of the game that says, well, he died in battle. Yeah, no resurrections. No, nothing. No restarting. Nothing. Uh, and, and you can't just... You can't just, uh, you know, you have to you have to restart the whole thing. Yeah, there's no saves there's coming. No, there's there's nothing like that. I meant to say you can't just restart it and it didn't happen because it still keeps track of how many times they died even when you reset. Really? Yes. Oh. So you you can you can you go in there and you can see wins and losses. <laughs> the losses it's talking. It's talking <laughs> that's about the what time. that is. Yeah, okay. it's talking about how many times that character died. Oh, I didn't so, realize that. Yeah. So that's the funny thing to me is going through it and seeing how many characters just got killed over and over. I was and over wondering again. what that was. Yeah, okay. I, I, it kind of was brutal to me at first because I'm used to RPGs where you just resurrect people or whatever, or where you just reset it and try it a bunch of times. But this has like a real time yeah. thing. It like tracks. You go to a town. Yeah. You feed him a phoenix down. Whatever. Like, yeah. It's normal. 
probably not a problem. But no, here, here it tracks all that detail. So there, there is not just resetting, you know, when things are going poorly. Like, I think you would have to reset before the final hit took took place or something. Well, uh, even then, I think your character is pretty much locked in at that point. Like, whatever RNG there was, I think is already locked it in. It might be. It might be. Uh, and yeah, there's some settings you can pick to see how fast that happens and so yeah. forth. But yeah, you you have... Uh, it's it's It takes that seriously. And when I play this... I generally, uh, I, I very quickly got to this perfectionist mode where I'm like, if I if someone dies, I reset. Yeah. Because I'm interested in keeping them all alive, taking them all to the end, seeing all their storylines, blah, blah, blah. Even if it, it doesn't really matter. Even if it doesn't get, really like, matter. like a couple sentences. Even if I never fight with them, I yeah. don't really want to lose them. I, and that's silly and stupid. I know a lot of people oh, look I at that as crazy. I understand it completely. But, it drives but me nuts. I instantaneously figured that, that that was what I wanted to play it as. Yep. Like, I just I, I immediately decided nope this is how I'm gonna play it and you have no idea how many times I had to reset games or oh, no, I do. In this game I, I have plenty of an <laughs> for idea that, for that reason because because like I said I started on hard mode where like yeah. your character is just poof yeah but you, you it's it's so hard to keep like especially the crappy characters who start yes. out with like bad stats and try to build them up like yeah. I'm sorry Matthew doesn't last in hard mode he's yeah. gone yeah you you can't send him out to go get a chest. Anything is one-shotting him. Yeah, so this game, you don't have some place to easily level characters up. So you have to level characters up by having them accompany someone who's actually good, having that character nearly kill an enemy unit and have your weak guy finish them off while not getting targeted and killed by the thing you're trying to kill. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's very like, so if you do yeah. a battle, it's it's a, it's a very, it's like a, a grid strategy game. Yeah. All of your characters are on a grid. You yeah. move your pieces around. It's kind of like checkers or whatever. Yeah. But you move your pieces next to another unit yeah, and you get a pre-fight screen that tells you kind of your chances yeah. To hit the unit, how many times you're going to hit the unit, what their counter strike is going to be. Yeah. And you basically tell like, okay, is it worth doing this battle at this point? Yes. Or do I want to maybe throw this person in a bush where they get like higher defensive stats and just kind of roll my dice there? Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's different, different stats for avoidance and stuff, depending where you are. There's, you can be in a little fort where you're going to regen hit points every turn. There's different places you can you can stand there's like a bush things. there's a mountain yeah. which is the best but yeah. like only certain characters can get on there like your uh yeah. your cavaliers can't get on a mountain yep yeah so. certain certain characters are able to go faster so like if you're a mounted character you get to go faster but you get slowed down by bushes and stuff like that. or like the desert for yes. example they just yes. straight up don't move <laughs> yep um, we should probably talk a little bit about the overall uh, presentation of the game. I think the music and the and the graphics and and sound effects are pretty serviceable for the platform, but I, not I think the really graphics, memorable. I think the graphics are excellent, especially the battle graphics. Sure, they look they look amazing. The only thing is, like I don't know about you, but I turned off the battle animation yes. like right away. Yeah, as soon as I figured that out, because yeah. it was about the time when I, I start repeating certain things over and over again yeah. and, and just failing, and it just was wasting so much time. I was like, I, I just need to, I, I know I already have it played out in my head how this fight's going to go. And then every time I do a little better, I it's, you know, and so I'm just repeating the same thing over and, and slightly extending it. I don't need to see the same thing every time. Yeah. I, need to, I need to get to the part where I was dying and then do better. Uh, but yeah, I the graphics I thought were fine. The sound effects were just kind of, okay they weren't memorable to yeah, me yeah i don't i, I wasn't i don't running. remember a single theme from this game yeah that was a little disappointing um i thought the hud was great it gives you it gives you a good balance of the stat detail that you want versus the graphics so yeah. it's not filling up the screen too much you have options to turn things off or show them uh you know if you want to avoid wasting time you have some shoulder button options to see more detail on units <laughs> um I, for the GBA especially, I thought this was great. The animations were cute. The little chibi faces were cute. Yeah, you yeah. Know. it's it's like hard to get better. Yeah, the 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 gameplay as a whole is just addictive as as all get out. I just I so especially the first one of these versus the first of the Shining Force. Like this yeah. game, I just could not put down. Oh, Whereas same here. So, some of the Shining Force stuff, I'd get a little bit frustrated. This game, I could not put down. I just. Once I started, I'm like, I'm playing this for a while, hon. Sorry. <laughs> so I think we both play this on the analog pocket, right? Yes, I which, played this on the Which, by pocket. the way, amazing. If you don't have one, it. try to find one. I love if it. If you like handheld gaming, like, there's... The, the only comparable thing you can get is, like, a fully modded Game Boy Advance. They do have some consoleizers out now. There's a, there's a handful of different GBA consoleizers which do a similar thing. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. like, if you want to play it in your 
yeah, I mean, but I I just loved being able to play it on my big screen. Oh, you is, played it on big screen. I played it mostly oh, on big okay. screen, but occasionally I'd, I'd sit down and just play with it handheld mode. It was nice having the option. I basically sat down. I was like watching movies or something with my wife, or she was playing yes. Call of Duty or something. I'm just yeah, playing that, on the couch. I, I started on the big screen, thinking <laughs> I'm just going to burn through this, oh, and no. then I'm like, nope, we're going to no. have to play through this while watching movies and stuff. This is yeah, going to take a while. <laughs> some some missions might take you a whole night of just resetting. Sometimes yep. just out of yep. range. Yep. Um, the downside of this, I think the big downside of this game for me and where it lost some points for me, some of these later levels are way too long. Like oh, some yeah. of these levels should almost have save points or they should be broken up into smaller fights or something. Well, that's what the second game did a little bit better. Yes. Not, not that we're moving on to it yet, but yes. Yeah. To me, uh, to me, there is, like I said, I, I look at these games, like I, it's a script in my head. I'm going to move this guy here, do this here, kill this enemy. I need to, I need to go into this village and save it before yeah. there, someone comes I'm, in and ruins it. I'm going to throw this guy into risky spot and yes. just roll my chances and hope he doesn't get KO'd. Yeah. And and just some having to buffer that many things in my head and then uh, oh and, and then I've done it so many times I start to get careless and, I, oh, forget, yeah. oh, and yeah. I forget that I did this thing here to avoid that and then that causes this to happen. Oh, so like, you left your little weenie like yes. out, out in the open somewhere or like there's some enemy can just like wrap around and, and take somebody out. It's almost to the point of taking notes of, of like what order <laughs> almost, I do would think almost. almost not quite. But it's it, there. Some of these are a little long, and again, I'm I'm not amazing at them. I'm just starting on some of these game, this style of game. But uh, it was great. It's it's frustrating, but great. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, some of my favorite things about this game are the uh, just the customization of how you want to build a party. Yep. So there are so many characters in the game, but you can only select a certain number of them for each map. Yeah. And once you stop using a character, they become pretty shitty pretty quick. Yeah. So, like, their stats won't increase that much, so they'll just start getting one-shotted, or they just won't deal damage, like, a mission later. So you really want to, like, okay, if you recruit a character, which isn't always easy... Yeah, you have to do certain things to recruit them sometimes. Yeah, just, sometimes, like, there's a person in a little house that's, like, halfway across the map, and you have to recruit them before, like, turn five... Or they're gone forever. Or you have to rescue them before they get killed by an, by enemy right. troops. Right, which which makes yeah. you want to do riskier strategies or use certain like flying units that yeah. suck early on. Yes. So you have to kind of figure out like okay, it, it, even sometimes before you play a game, if you want to get like really detailed about it, you kind of you can pick out your party. Like okay, do I want to use a thief? Yeah. But okay, if I use a thief here, I can't actually promote them until like way late in the game. So is it really worth it? Mm -hmm. I don't know. You have to kind of like figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Do you want to play some characters because they look cool? Because they're the best? Because they have a you know a certain stat? Because you want to build a certain party a certain way? And also, you have to keep in mind that they don't always have the same stats from game to game. Oh, right. Yeah. They, they have a certain growth level, but they may not always turn out as well. So you may see in the guide, if you read a guide, for example, that says, oh, I always use this character. And then you play through it. Well, this character ended up way worse in stats than this other character. So yeah. I'm going to use this other one instead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Every time you level up. Yeah. So you get experience for pretty much everything in that game. Uh, if you get to 100 points, your character levels up. There's yeah. no customization in the level up. It basically rolls a die for each one of these stats. Yes. And if the die is yes, then you get a point in that stat. Yeah. So some characters basically have a better chance in some certain stats of leveling it up. Right. And some characters, like uh, uh, the dancer, for example, will never get like a, a point in strength. Right, because they can't actually attack. Yeah. yeah. So like, there's just yeah. certain things like that that, like, okay... Your character can just do a bunch of bad rolls and just be like weak, yeah, it's, or yeah, have like no random. defense or no res. Yep. Like it, for me, it was always like uh, you know a, a fist bump when my uh, pirate yeah. character got a point in res. Right. And and also some characters are much easier to level up. In the first game, it was much harder to level up healers because Way harder, yeah. they they didn't get that much XP and they couldn't re they couldn't actually they couldn't attack at all. I think not until you promote them. Not right? until you promote them into a mage class that actually has attack spells. And, uh, and so, yeah, you'd, you'd have to deliberately delay fights and let them heal a bunch more to get XP because and that gonna, gets boring. Yeah. Quick. And it gets boring. And some characters, as we said earlier, they're, if they're really weak, if they're not dealing, dealing, killing blows, they're getting piddling XP. Oh yeah. You know, if it, you get a little XP for hitting, but you mostly get your XP from killing things. Yeah. It's like the difference <laughs> between like four XP and like 40. Right. Sometimes. Yeah. Right. So that's real frustrating. Um, you have to be a little bit cautious of the weapon triangle, right? So yeah. you have you have swords and axes and and lances or spears. It's a rock paper scissors. rock paper scissors. Mm. And so you may like a certain character, uh, but maybe they're locked to swords. 
And so you have to be careful you don't send them down Lance Alley where they're going to get <laughs> you, destroyed. You send them toward the, towards the berserkers <laughs> toward the, the berserkers pirates. with the axes, yes. Yeah, you, you send the knights towards, uh, I don't know, the, the knights are just kind of all-around good. Yeah, you you send some, them towards the sword people, I guess, which yeah, there aren't many. but you have some, Yeah, you have the knight characters usually have sword and lance, although some of them, uh, some of them get axes, some of them can cover all three. Yeah. Uh, some characters like, like uh, Lynn is locked to sword. I think later on she might get bow if you when when you she gets it so late yes. it's not even worth using whatever that secondary item is. Yeah, and so you 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 got to figure out which characters you like, but you also got to make sure you're covering the the weapon triangle, and then there's the magic triangle, which is similar for anima magic and dark magic, you know, shamanistic magic and uh, light magic. <laughs> and the the uh, the magic triangle matters a lot in the first game. Yes, the triangle kind of just in general goes out the window in the second. But yeah, I mean, I'll we'll bet. get to that. But yeah. Yeah, so uh, promotions in this game uh, kind of work at a... So you can level your character out from 1 to 20. Yep. And if you promote them at level 20, they basically they keep all their stats. Mm-hmm. They gain a bunch of stats from the promotion themselves. And then their promotional class can gain whatever stats that class is. So some are like higher in strength. Some will basically raise your, your caps and your bars to like whatever the new limit is. But you kind of have to walk this fine line of like when you're going to promote your units. Right. So in the first Fire Emblem game, there's really no grinding to do other than a thing called the arenas. Right. Which is a very, I don't want to say it's coin flippy because it's really not. But it's basically like you you pay X amount to battle basically a random fighter. A single one of your fighters battles a single single fighter in the arena. Yeah, and yeah. if you win, great. You get experience point and money. Yep. Uh, but your character can also die. And then they permanently die. And then they're dead. So yeah. you have to like play the arena really closely. And even while they're in the arena, they're getting attacked by outside units as well. So yeah. You have to shield them and protect them. You you almost realistically have to beat the almost beat the level, but not finish it. Like not not send Delightwood or whoever in to seize the thing. Yeah. And then sit there and use the arena. You know, and again, some people quibble about whether this is part intended or not you can abuse the arena to level up anyone that that is falling behind and just keep going through level af- or going through to um uh, turn after turn yeah. after turn after turn doing the arena and again hope you don't screw up because then if you do you might have to reset and start the whole thing over again waste an hour of your waste life doing literally nothing. so much time <laughs> and you do get a lot of money and you can you know it's it's the easiest way to to catch people up Again, the alternative would just be to say if, if they didn't if they don't catch up, I'm just going to drop them and I'm going to pick someone else. But it's it's not easy in this game. Yeah, it's <laughs> one of those things. So you can promote starting at level ten. So yeah. if we get back to our healer conversation, like yeah, you can get them to level twenty, but it takes yeah. such an ungodly yes. amount of time because it's basically ten heals per level, and yeah. it it's, takes longer than you think. Yeah. So yeah, and you can't use the arena for them. So generally for the healers, I just promote them at ten so they could start doing something more useful. Yeah, because the the promoted promoted classes all are all basically better. I don't think there's anything there's worse about worse, them. No, not but, the first game. But the problem is, yeah, if you want to max them out, you want to get to level twenty, then promote, and then get to level twenty. But but that assumes you're going to max them out in the course of the game. That's not a given. Which is tough. I mean, it's, until it's the last given. couple levels, it gets really hard. Because again, unless you're abusing the arena, there's a there's a limited amount of XP available. Yeah. And especially once you get to a certain point, it might not be possible to level a certain character if they're too weak. And if you accidentally <laughs> leave a stronger unit, like yeah out in the open somewhere they can soak up a lot of xp on accident yes they're only getting like one xp per round instead of like your other characters to get like 20 or 30 yeah you have characters that are pre-promoted like there's a paladin you get very early on um that it's it, kind of like a catch yeah he can he can destroy everything but he's getting very little xp for doing it so he's taking xp away from your other characters that badly need it and his base stats are trash yeah so like late game is not useful yeah so you you really you can use him as a crutch but the more you use him as a crutch the harder it makes the game overall yeah so you're better off barely using him at all like just just use him where you absolutely need him like a rescue yes. person or yes it would almost be better if you trade his weapon away yes. to somebody else and just have him soak up, like, uh, attacks. Yeah, don't because if he counterattacks, yeah, he'll get XP and he'll kill things and blah, right. blah, blah. Um, yeah, so the also, it also has an interesting fortune system where it in, tries to encourage, it gives you a fortune for the next map and tries to encourage you to use certain units, which is kind of interesting. If you, if you cool. level up enough characters, it'll sometimes tell you, oh, you should have a a thief for this level or you you need some flyers for this level that, again if you have enough i assume you took the fortune teller with you right no 
Okay, well, that's the, the fortune teller lady. Maybe you have to rescue her, but you rescue her, and then she follows you along, and then later she gets replaced by the the uh, bard or the bard character. But you can talk to them before every fight, and they they tell you your fortune. They tell you what stuff oh, okay. you should take for the next the next level. Maybe I got her, but I've never used the fortune option. Okay. I remember seeing the fortune yeah. option, but I'm like, I don't, doesn't it cost money to use? A, t- a piddling amount of money. Yeah, whatever. I didn't, I'm, I'm poor. So but I mean, you can, you can also it. just pay her and then reset the game if you uh, want to cheese it. But, uh, uh, but yeah, she there's... just gives you an idea like, hey, this is a, this is a, there's something you're going to need a thief for because there's going to be a ton of chests or whatever. See, but I was just into like a check map and I'm like, okay, yeah. anytime you see it's a castle, you know yeah. there's going to be chests. Well, at least I knew. But... I, I think it's more if you're just not good at the game yet. If you, sure. if you don't have, like, once you play the game for a while, you know, oh, there's archers everywhere. I'm not going to take a ton of flyers yeah. with me. Yeah, or based gonna... on this map look, yes. like, I know there's going to be, like, a bunch of, there's going to be knights in a yeah. castle. So, like, yeah. To bring my axe people. Yeah, like my flyers aren't going to be super helpful here because there's tight corridors. Yeah, like they're so, not going to yeah. do anything. Yeah, so it, that's a neat. It, it kind of helps you learn the game uh, other than just beating your head against it. <laughs> um, I This is one of those games that has limited use on your items. So every item you get, every sword, every lance, whatever, has so many uses that it breaks. And, and that's pretty much a staple in almost every single Fire Emblem game. And I normally don't like that. Like, I hated it in the Final Fantasy Game Boy games. Here oh, yeah. it works. Here, I think it makes sense because it's a resource. You know, you have to, you can buy more. If you have enough money, you can buy and keep more with you. Uh, you can be careful to not use your good weapons on weak troops. Uh, you know, you can, you have s- certain really good things. You have to decide, do I give them to my weak units so that they have an easier time leveling up? Or do I give them my strong units so they can destroy things? Uh, you know, you got to balance it with power up items and, and healing items and antidotes and all that stuff. It's, it's neat. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of times where I'd use the worst version of an item just cause it always has a stronger chance to hit. Yeah. Or like, a yeah. And sometimes like a, it's also, uh, weighs less. So it gives you a better, uh, speed check. Yep. some of your battles yep uh also uh, i feel like some of the classes were more balanced for this game than others uh we could go into more detail but like archers i struggled to use archers in this game i especially early once you you got to level them up enough to be useful which is hard i used will in the yeah. first one yeah um did i need to no did he help me not really you really need to baby them a lot, and then they're probably fine, but... You had a high attack rating, but, I like, mean, whatever. It, like, like that's an example of a class that it's fine, but it's fragile. Yeah. And, and I could just assume... I could do the same thing with a mage. And, Correct. And, and they're way better. And, like, for, and like, in that particular case, like they don't counterattack the way other classes do. You know, every other... You know, right, any, yeah. any, any other class with ranged spells, like a, ra- a ranged magic can counterattack, and, like, someone using a, a, a hand axe at range can counterattack in melee, but an archer can't. An archer, if you get up somebody up in melee range and attack them, they can't counterattack. Which means they get less experience overall, because yes. it takes longer to level them up. Yeah, so they're, they're frustrating. There are certain classes that were more frustrating than others. I think in, uh, in uh, some of the later games, you can get a bow that can attack with one range, but... I don't recall. There's a longbow that has, le- and that's the other problem is the you. I would expect archers to have longer range. By yeah, default, they only have like two. By default, it's two instead of one. Yeah. So you can place them behind another unit, and if if it's blocked, then they can't get easily attacked, which is fine. But otherwise, they're kind of useless. It kind of feels like that should be a pole arm instead of a an archer, you know. But if you you can get them a longbow, which is only three. Which is is still good. not much. It's yeah. it's good because you can you can put somebody outside the range of a boss yeah. and have them attack without risk of counterattack. But it's such a piddling damage. It's yes. almost not even worth it. Yeah, yeah. Um, as we said, there's a there's a variety of of units uh, ways go, to go over units. some classes. Or, yeah, let's let's go over yeah. the classes. I like the class talk. Yeah. So uh, archer, I consider the archer and the sniper just bad. The archer sniper being the promoted class. You can use them, but they're completely skippable. They're just noticeably worse to me than all other units. The only thing they're good at, other than killing flyers, because they have an advantage to shooting, you know, like Pegasus knights and so forth, is is that they have that little bit extra reach with a longbow. I, they're just too fragile to be worth it. Uh, next, you get the fighter, which uh, promotes to the warrior, which I call part of the Mook trio. <laughs> they're probably <laughs> the worst basic melee class. They're yes. kind of the generic Mooks of the game. Uh, those are the they're, they're axe users, so they hit pretty hard, especially against spear users. They can't take hits terribly well. 
uh, use them sparingly and only with proper support. They're like a weird glass cannon with a yeah. high HP. It yes. makes no sense. Yeah, so not so great. I, I don't think I used any of those other than uh, Dart, who's actually a pirate uh, right. in my gameplay. Yep. So that's the that's the fighter warrior. Next, you got the Myrmidon, which evolves the sword sword master. I think there's only one in that game. I believe so. That's I consider them the second part of the Mook trio. They play very similar to the fighter war the uh, fighter warrior. Again, good offense, mediocre defense. The main difference is they get more high skill and more frequent critical hits. Yeah. So, so they actually dodge a lot later yes, on. Yes. And, and they their crit chance ends up being like high fifties. So. I find them more useful. I find it more useful in, you know, just one of them, maybe just a small number of them. But you got to, again, you got to support them. They can't just amaze. You can't just do amazing on their own. Well, but, for me, it was like, okay, if you learn how to play a Myrmidon correctly, yeah. what you do is you throw them with like a, an iron sword, something kind of right. weak. Right. Uh, that also is, it, it gives you a high speed check. And you toss them in a bush. And you toss them way the hell out in the middle of battle. Right. And you just like... You just leave them alone, yeah. and what's going to happen is they level up really quick, and they become so skillful like that they cannot be hit. Right. Like their hit chance ends up being like a thirty percent, right? Which is very low in that game, and it's like you can make them broken. Yeah, you just have to do it correctly. Yep, they're yep. not good in the arena, right? Because they get like two shot in the arena, so right. you really have to like put them under cover. Right, makes sense. Yeah. And then the third part of the Mook trio, as I call them, is the Pirate or Berserker. And yep. that's a sim- another similar class to the Mirrodon Swordmaster. Uh, it also has a high crit chance, but I consider them slightly better because they have the ability to traverse water or mountains. Yeah, which makes them yeah. super useful. Use them about the same way as a Mirrodon. Uh, yeah, they're, they're good, but they're not. You got to support them right or, or treat them right. So know? I used Dart in this playthrough because yep. he has a very high attack, very high HP, and like yep. okay defense and res. Yep. And yeah, I I used him instead of a flying class during my playthrough mm-hmm. because I mean we'll talk about the flying classes, but like they start out so weak. Whereas like the pirate starts out pretty good, yeah. But he hurt. also like if you max out the pirate and you you turn him into a berserker, yep. Not only does he keep his walk on water stat, yep. But like he's probably the hardest hitter outside of Hector in the entire game, yeah. Yeah, especially against Lance users, and there's a lot of Lance users. Oh, yeah, just straight up smash. <laughs> Destroy those knights. Yep. I, oh, you have to watch out for the ones that have swords as well, because then they can respond in kind. But if you yeah, kill like, them first, uh, it doesn't matter. Axe <laughs> Reavers or whatever. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, so then you have the Thief uh, Assassin. Uh, this is another high offense, low defense class, but it gets an instant kill ability. Uh, so essentially a, a slightly better version of the critical hit thing that the Myrmidons get. And they have the added benefit of being able to unlock doors and chests or steal from enemy units until you class change them. That's one unfortunate thing. When you turn them from a thief to assassin, they no longer have the steal ability. Yeah. Which is fine because at a certain point in the game, you don't you don't really see a lot of things to steal from anymore. No. So it's... It's, it's, it's pretty it's, useless overall. But. I, I'd say it's it, this class is situational. It's worth taking exactly one... For any level with a door or chest. Other than that, eh, you can well, just... I think there's only one until you get the other assassin that uh, Jafar or whatever yes. the hell his name is, like, way late in the game. Who is he's, pretty badass. He's so. actually really good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you get Matthew. The, the only problem with Matthew, though, like, yeah. okay, so you can max him out pretty quickly level 20. Yeah. But, like, him at level 20 is like most other characters at, like, level 11. Right. Like, he's not very strong. He has good avoidance. He has yep. good speed. He doesn't hit very hard. And he's got shit defense, so you really have to hide him and to use him well. Well, or turn him into into assassin, because once you turn him into assassin, well, he becomes a lot more like a Myrmidon. Here's gonna be my next thing: like, yeah. when can you turn him into an assassin? It's pretty damn late in the game, isn't it? Uh, it is. I mean, I, I, I it's I, like your last like five missions. Or I, I didn't end up turning him into assassin. I ended up switching to Jafar as soon as I got Jafar, and then oh, I just right. kept and I used him the whole game. I, I, think, I used both like an idiot, but like. I think having it, one, I think having exactly one of them is useful. You may not take him on every mission, but having him is always good. I yeah, think. they end up getting kind of outclassed, except for like Jafar. He's super easy just to throw in. And well, like yeah, like I said, you got, work. you got a fully leveled up uh, assassin. It's basically the same as a Myrmidon, or a pot, a slightly master. better. Maybe he's like a good sword master. Yeah, then. yeah. Um, so uh, then we move on to the Pegasus Knight uh, and slash Falcon Knight. 
This is another situational class. They're not really great at either offense or defense, but their flight ability is, is where there is why you'd bring them. They have the, the most extreme movement speed in the game. They're essential for ferrying around slower units. So, cause in this game, you have a rescue mechanic. You can take a one unit and pick up another unit. And then that unit that you picked up is, is now hidden from enemy attack. They can't, they, you can heal them. Like you can, you can target things that are, you can sometimes, I think you can, in this game, I know in the second game, you can target them for heals or trading and stuff, but your enemies can't attack them. So you can pick them up. You can cart them around. If somebody's really slow, you can pick them up and take them somewhere quickly. Um, and, or you can move up and attack an enemy and then rescue them before the enemy can counterattack or the boss or whatever can not, they, they have, they get the default counterattack, but then not there. You can rescue them before they get their turn to attack back. I think you can rescue NPCs too, right? You can. Uh, so a lot of times what I'll do is if, if you have to guard an NPC, I'll just rescue them and keep them rescued the whole, the whole, uh, the whole, uh, map. I don't give them a chance to wander around and do stupid things. <laughs> the The one thing is you have to have, I think there's an aid stat, which defect, affects how heavy of a unit they can pick up. So they can't always pick up the heaviest knights. An uh, aid or a con strat? Yeah. If, yeah the, the aid, however high their aid is, means how high of a con character oh, they okay. can pick up. Right. So if you can get at least one Pegasus Knight or later on Wyvern Wide Rider that has a high aid, they're really good. I, I usually used one or two of them, mostly for, for shuttling people around. Um, I didn't use them a lot for combat. I In this game especially, I found that they were kind of meh for combat, especially if there's a lot of archers around because archers will destroy them. Yeah. The, they start out so hard to level up. They are hard to level up. They they my, so looking at that that win loss the that first <laughs> that first Pegasus Knight you get I forget her name she's the she sucks the, the shy the shy shrinking yeah. violet character she died so many times in my she, playthrough so <laughs> I, I on this playthrough I just avoided them I'm like yeah. dude I don't want to spend the time to try to make this work. I read so many th- articles saying, oh, she's great. You just got to put a lot of effort in. I never, she never was great for me. Maybe I had bad luck with her stats. Eh, yeah. I, I don't know. To me, I use them for rescuing. Don't expect them to fight much. Yeah. I use her for, you can, they do get some bonuses against magic users. So you can sometimes send them in to snipe a magic user, basically. Like Sure. Or, or if they're yeah. like, if you get them like maxed out, you can just throw them in a pile of mages. But yeah. like. You have to be. You have to be ready cares. to pull them out before the, before the melee or the archers show yeah. up. <laughs> I, I would use them only if you really want to put the effort into like severely grinding in this game. Yep. Uh, next, you got the uh, monk class and the cleric class, both of which can class change to bishop. And this is kind of weird because you have two different base classes that both class change to the same thing. Um, the, the, they're basically both healer classes, and to me. This feel like felt like the weaker healing class. No, they're I still. I think I used a monk in my playthrough. Yeah, I they're they're kind of. I think the monk and, cha- and cleric felt kind of interchangeable. They had some minor yeah. differences, but um, I, I feel like at least one of them is critical early on. But um, you wanna you wanna replace them as soon as you get a better option because yep. they're all they do is heal. They can't they can't fight. Uh, and you know they they don't. Uh, you, so you have classes that can level up. Um, that can level up into a mage class that can heal and and nuke and so forth. But the, the Bishop is just, just a pure, I I don't believe the Bishop in this game got an attack uh, thing. No, he got light. Oh no, I'm sorry. He got, I'm sorry. He got light. Well, you didn't need it. He did. Well, I mean, it it would have helped, but it's not like in the later game where they're a little more interchangeable here. It just felt like a distinctly worse class. And, and it took so long to get to the game where they're, where they're actually useful as an attacker at all. Oh, yeah. And so that they're just always lagging behind. Anyway, uh, I, I consider him a below average healer, but somewhat needed early on. Yep. Uh, next you get the knight or general. I, I consider this the average, the most average of the average classes. Uh, they're pretty hard to kill with anything but magic. They're great to put in a choke point and just watch the enemy melee units beat themselves to death oh, yeah. on it. Um, their offense is okay. Uh, not amazing. Um, their weapon availability isn't quite as good as a cavalier or paladin. Uh, their movement speed is absolutely abysmal. This is just a, a tank you set somewhere and they just hold that point. Yeah. And this is one of those things where it's like, on my, uh, on my playthrough with sacred stones, I, I fed my general, like one of those movement speed buff items. Yeah, yeah. But in the first game, uh, I didn't use it at all. Cause, uh, if you yeah. play in a hard mode, you almost, you're forced to use them Yeah, cause you need something that can just soak up. Yep hits and uh, no other unit can do it early on yep Yep. so like if you really spend the time on a night like they are unkillable tanks yep 
And they deal okay damage. They're yeah. not very fast, so you're not going to get a lot of two hits out of them, but... Yep. I mean, they're they're okay if you want to spend the time on them. Once yeah. they're general, I mean, they're almost unkillable. And, and they can use uh, they can use javelins, so you get some... Yeah, I mean, you, you definitely get use out of them if you, if you want to, for sure. Yep, I believe they... I think the standard knight, I believe, uh, just gets the javelin. I don't think they get sword, but the general might get the sword. I, well, there's like a spear, too, or whatever yeah. you can use, but... Um, then you get to the mercenary slash hero, which I consider another average class. It, it to me, it feels better than the fighter warrior in every way. Um, I I didn't use mine in this playthrough at all. I just found his early level so shitty. I just didn't feel like it. I, I could see that you'd have to level him up to get it caught up. But I, they have great offense, good defense. They're kind of the flip side of the knight general, yeah. uh, but with better movement speed. Um, still kind of weak against magic, but. Um, just basically a, a better a better uh, melee mook than than the other ones I mentioned. Yeah, if you want to take the time to level him up, like yeah. he basically turns into a god. Like, yeah, maxed th- out. it becomes a much more um, self sufficient class. Yeah. Uh, next, you got the nomad, or which evolves to a nomadic trooper. Um, uh, this is an average, uh, slightly above, av- better than the other option, archer. Yeah, if you're going to um, use an archer, use a nomad. Yeah, That's essentially what it comes down to. The, the added speed makes them a little more usable. Not amazing. Um, they do get the ability to counterattack with swords after class change, which is the main weakness of the archer. Yep. Um, it's still clunkier than j- hand axes or javelins, but whatever. They almost get it so late in the game, you don't even care. Yeah, they do uh, have less of the uh, effect of weather and terrain than most mounted troops, so it's kind of a, a unique thing to this. You only get the one guy that has it, so Wrath, I think, is his name. Yeah, we totally forgot yeah. to mention, too, for the for the archers, they can use the blisses on the map. Which, Ugh. not every map has them, so it's not really worth it. But. I, I tried. I never I never have found any good use of it. It just See, I, I used that Will a lot, and I, yeah. I actually buffed him up pretty good. He has a very high, like, uh, strength sure. stat. So, sure. like, you can get a lot of use out of him, but was it really better than not? Probably not. It, it, it just it didn't seem... To me, all I did is made, try to make sure to kill the archers on the enemy side so yeah, I couldn't use exactly. those things, and then I ignored them. Yeah. Uh, next, you got the to me the first above average class, which is the Wyvern Rider, Wyvern Rider, uh, which come, becomes a Wyvern Lord, uh, basically a bulkier, harder hitting uh, Pegasus Knight. Uh, they're still they're vulnerable to archers still, and they're also vulnerable to magic users, unlike the Pegasus Knight. But you can toss them into the middle of yeah. you know knights, and they're not going to die. Yeah, they're they're great for flying in and rescuing and stuff, but they can actually take a hit. Yep. Uh, again, don't use them to fight magic users, but they're uh, they. I think they tend to have a higher aid stat, so they're even better in some ways for ferrying people around. Yeah, the only thing that sucks is you get it so late in the game. I think it's just yeah. that one guy is Heath or whatever. Uh, yeah, I think it's just the one. Maybe. Yeah, and you you get him pretty late, so you really yeah. gotta like spend the time to build him if you want to use him. I felt he was worth it. I I, I, I mean, he's good. I the, just didn't care. The sooner I leveled him up, the less I used my, my Pegasus yeah. Knight. And there's I think there's two or three Pegasus Knights total and I never liked any of them as much as I him. didn't use any of them in the first game. Um then we get like to the other to me ab- above average class, the Cavalier or Paladin. Uh, to me, they've got this combination of movement speed, attack power, durability, and available weapon types that just makes them really well-rounded. Uh, the ca- the basic, ca- that's the Paladin. The Cavalier is slightly worse, mostly, yeah. be- mostly because the Paladin gets all three weapon types. The Cavalier only gets lance and sword. And you really got to build them up early because they can be do. kind of like a paperweight. They don't hit very hard. They can take a hit or two, but not... I, I feel like the paladin especially gets way better. Uh, again, all but that one paladin who's who do, has shitty stats. Yeah, but yeah. most of your you cavaliers, you get some good cavaliers early in the game that uh, you know, like three or four of them, honestly, that you could all turn to paladins and they're all worth using. Or they're, they're all at least above average to me, to my mind. They're also a good rescue option. They get you if you have a lot of mounted people like them. They have, oh, yeah. they have a high uh-huh. aid stats, so they can all rush in and rescue people and and you know take slower people along. And so forth. I just used one random one, I think, during my playthrough. I, I Sade, is that what his name was? I don't yeah. even remember. They're kind of goofy looking one. You don't need them, but you couldn't do wrong with like three or four of them. Yeah, there's like him and Kent. Yes. I, I think I late, used them the whole game. I think yeah. late game they get kind of shitty, but like mm. it's just, just comparatively to like some of your other units can hit a lot harder, but like they're not ever bad they, they they're just so well-rounded they yeah. don't really have a weakness yeah. i never i never really regretted having a few of them uh next you got the mage which upgrades to the sage it's another yeah. above average class so that's it's a great magical attacker for most of the game it's great for taking out heavily armored melee types and certain types of ranged attackers and then it promotes to a competent healer 
Uh, about the only reason I don't use them more is because the next class is even better. But they're they're a great mage and they're a great healer. Which class are you talking about? The next class that's even better is the shaman slash druid. Oh, I don't agree. To me, <laughs> and, and this is may, this might be a little bit of a feel, it might be based on their stats, it yeah. felt more useful than the mage sage, which already was above average. Okay. To me, they perform basically the same function, but they can take more of a beating and they can self-heal with Nosferatu while doing damage. That's right, but I mean, like... Uh, and they have a bunch of useful effects, that like spells that ignore defenses. To me, they're an essential class. You, uh, you need one. My only problem with them is that their their hit percentage is always a lot lower than it a is. standard mage. It is. So, like, I never like rolling the die, personally. I'm just yeah. like, I like having my set number. Like, I yeah. know the mage is going to hit yeah. 99% of the time, every time, no matter who the enemy is. Right. So, like, I used the the early mage in the game, yeah. max it out, got it to a sage, max it out. Yep. That is a character that I could throw in a bush yeah. anywhere in the map, and it could solo the entire map. Sure. Sure. So, like, that character was so broken yeah. on its own. Yeah. And, like, is this, uh, I, I might have used the Shaman. I, I don't remember if I did or not, but, like, I'm pretty sure I just skipped it. I will say, again, this game has a ma- has a magic magical triangle. So, yeah. it's it's useful to have one. It's useful to have a bishop and a sage and a druid. I, I would leave out the bishop, if anyone. But it was, it was worth having a sage and a druid, especially, because it gives you some options to fight different enemy mage Yeah, types. I had the Valkyrie and the sage. The sage could actually yeah. take shots. The Valkyrie is still, like, a paperweight, but... Yeah, oh, yeah. And so, that makes us to the next class, which I also consider essential, the Troubadour, which turns into a Valkyrie. I consider them the best healing class in the game, uh, mostly because they have decent speed. They can get in and out of, oh, of yeah. melee quickly. Uh, and then, and also a reasonable magical attacker, although I didn't end up using them much for that. Uh, I didn't, again, they, they lagged behind before I was able to promote them. That, that's one class where if you put it into a spot where it can be hit, it can yeah. pretty much get one shot by most things. Yeah, you have to be careful with them, but again, they're, they're very, they have a high speed, so they can get in, heal, get out, get rescued, whatever, and they can still, they can still do a little bit of nuking, although mostly for me, it was just the highly mobile heal that yeah. I wanted. I, I used the, the psychic healing for the most part, the really long range healing. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, the, so this, you pair this with another class, we'll, which we'll mention momentarily, and you don't need two healers. You just have one healer and a dancer, which oh, is yeah. the other essential class. Uh, also, you, you either have a dancer or a bard. Uh, that's a little bit of a spoiler, but they do the same thing. They don't, they do nothing directly, but they they do dances that that give other class other characters additional moves yeah so they they you 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 have another character they do an action then they gray out you you dance at them and then they're an ungrade and then they get a whole another turn they also have some other dances that like they're kind of like the boost spell in shining force they i rarely i never used them yeah i never did i can in the next game they took that out entirely because i think they realized everyone just used them for the extra oh yeah why, why would you waste your time like but yeah, yeah, to me that that is the, this is the the essential class. It's the shenanigans class. There are yeah. so many things. There are maps where you can get your whole stuff. You like you take your fast characters and you you rescue the slow characters and you rush and you have your dancer dance at the people <laughs> yeah, that yeah, are slightly yeah, exactly. slower. And and if you if you really fancy, you can you can dance at somebody and then have them rescue the dancer and then rush and then drop them. You can do all these crazy shenanigans and get way faster across the map than you're supposed to. Or, or or do more damage to a boss or something than you're supposed yeah, sure. to. It's just so many options. And and it, and you can essentially double another class. You can take a good class like a healer with physics and give them twice as many uh, moves. It's great. So And then finally you get the Lord, which turns into either a Knight Lord, a Great Lord, or a Blade Lord, depending on which of the three Lords it is. Yeah, those are just exclusive to your main characters. Yep. And uh, that's it's a special class. You you kind of have to have one with you or three. I, I took all three of them through the whole game. I thought it was worth I always it. said, too, Lynn, for me, fell off super hard. Lynn's probably the weakest because she's sword limited. She gets better when she gets the bow. But again, that's late in the game. Yeah, And I, I started with the Hector story. So you get yeah. her like super late in the Hector story. And she is terrible. I think you, you almost have to do her map first to power her up. Yeah, uh, or you have to feed the shit out of her. Or you have to feed the it, shit out of her. It's really hard. Yeah, she's she's the most likely to be vulnerable to getting destroyed if you're if you don't baby. Oh yeah, her she enough. got terrible defense and yes. really bad HP. She she's more like a Myrmidon, so you gotta you gotta get her high enough out where she can dodge a lot, but she can also get destroyed if she doesn't. So So like I, I had kind of like a mistake is I, I knew that the Lord promotions were so late in the game. Yes. But I had leveled up Hector to level twenty like very early in the game. Yes. So for the longest time I just had 
had to throw them like behind the entire party in a bush and just not use them. Yeah, that's the other thing is is uh, depending on which one you're playing, if it's Hector or Lywood, they they can only promote at a very specific time in the game, which whereas, is like the last few chapters. Yes. Whereas the other two, there's there's a couple specific items that you can use to promote them. One of which I think you get like halfway through the game, and the other is like three quarters of the way through the game that's or something. something yeah. uh, so you can evolve. You can promote all three of them. I don't know why I say evolve. You can promote all three of them. <laughs> Pokemon. Right. Uh, you can promote all three of them, but um, it, they, they tend to be a little late. So, yeah, you don't want to use them too much, but you want to use them enough that they're tough. Because, again, if they die, you lose that match. You use that map immediately. Well, like, Hector is straight up yeah. the best unit in the game. Oh, I love Hector. Pretty much He's through great. the entire game. He's great. Yeah. And, yeah. and Ellie Wood is a very close second if yes. you spend the time to really buff him up. Uh, yeah, I believe when, when Hector promotes, I think he gets to use swords. Before that, he's axe You don't even care, because, like, his axes are so busted. The, yeah, you almost don't. Yeah, he, he has, like, high crit axes and stuff that just destroy things, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, he yeah. has, like, his own unique axe that only him can use. Yes. And, like, it is so ungodly powerful early in the game. Yep, yep. Whereas Eli- Eliwood gets uh, lance and sword, which is maybe a better combo, but he's not, like, as personally tough than, as Hector in some ways. He does get a lot of HP yes. later on. Yeah, uh, he was a little. I was a little more worried about him getting beat up if I sent him against a boss. Oh, or for something. sure. Like Hector's got basically knight's defense. Yeah, Hector, you, you with know, like a cavalier's movement speed and yeah. like a, you know an axe wielding uh, attack point. Yeah, I think all he's th- so broken. I think all three of them get mounted movement speed when they promote. I believe I forget. That's why I was surprised when they were doing Smash Brothers. I was really surprised that Hector was never one of them. Yeah, because like he yeah. was unique in that he he's like one of the only lords in the games where that uses axes. Most of them are either magic or sword. Yeah, I mean, none of the three of these made it into any Smash Bros. Uh, Lynn did as, uh, like, a random oh. item in one of them. Right, right, but but not as char- characters that you not can Not as play playable with. ones, though. But anyway, I think that's pretty much all my notes I have on this game. Uh, it has some non-essential systems, like the support system, where you can you have people basically talk to each other during a fight and waste a turn. And yeah. it, it only it only happens in certain circumstances. Like I think the unit has to fight together for a while near each other, and then I they, think they, that's how it works. It, it's weird because I I would check periodically to look for support. You have to you have to watch because the support option just shows up when it's available. Yeah, and then you just have to use it, and you can only use it for a certain amount of time or whatever or certain circumstances and then the more you do it the more you build up support between certain characters the more bonuses they get when they fight together which isn't always a good idea because you know you're trying to strategize who should go where you don't want to care necessarily about their support and it's not needed it's not maybe needed. it's needed in hard mode i don't know maybe but, but then it also affects the storyline so if you're really big into the storyline you can certain characters will marry certain other characters or do certain other things depending on who they have high support with yeah it's i'm neat. not even gonna mention the story it's like a generic rpg dot story kind of it's not exciting. I, I could see like I, it's like a further rabbit hole to worry about all the alternate storylines oh, no. and, and yeah. try and try and get the you know get your 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 uh, fire emblem waifu to marry whoever <laughs> you want. You know, it's, oh no, that that's in the later <laughs> games. Yeah, right. They, they really expand the support options in the later games. You get to yes. like marry off units. Yes. Some of the games also have like offspring that your yes. two supporting units can produce. Yep. That like okay, the first half of the game follows these characters, and the second half follows the offspring of yep. these characters. Yep. That like can be utterly busted depending on like yeah they they basically who goes the other. they start that here but it's not essential you can ignore it if you don't you want can it. completely ignore it it's it whatever. also it also has that a rating thing where you, you can ask it every turn how good your rating is which for the most part I think it's gonna be good unless you're losing people no. or if you're like me and taking like like a hundred turns in the arena making this one map go super long it lowers your rating like who cares like you gotta do it <laughs> I mean it's just something they add for replayability it I don't is. know if you noticed like after you beat the game yeah uh, there's a new menu option that kind of shows you your star rating for your last campaign playthrough yep. like one to five stars for each yep. one, one of these categories yeah that's what i was talking about yeah okay so yeah that's you can kind see, of a you can fun see it thing. every map yeah it's just something that kind yeah. of adds on especially back yeah. in the day where there was only like, a, like i have too many too many things to play to go back to like yeah. really care about it but yeah it is kind of nice to know like okay what does the game think about my last playthrough yeah yeah like i said you can you can check it between every map I didn't even know. You can that. see yeah. every every map. You can see uh, that, that's why I noticed it started going down when I was abusing the arena because <laughs> yeah. it, it, that taking too long lowers your rating because it counts your turns at the end of the game. Yes. So I'm sure your turn count was pure it's shit. way too high. Yeah. yeah. Yep. 
but yeah, other than that, uh, I think it's a great game. I think it. Um, I would definitely play it again. I, I need to play oh. actor mode. Um, you need to try hard mode. I, I need to try like, hard mode. It'll it'll have you pissed off real quick i will say it loses the overall presentation isn't perfect it's great but not perfect the difficulty is a little too uneven um like the overly long levels the big mistakes you can make early on like with using the wrong characters uh, and and waste xp and the graphics and sound to me were only average especially the sound Uh, i give it a i think a four star is is fair i could see 4.5 but i think four is fair I, I for me it's a four point five just uh, because if you do decide to turn on the graphics like the battle animations yeah they're very pretty they are they're, they're kind of like uh they're not as good but they're kind of like a golden sun type of battle animations I don't know if you ever played that ah, another one I need to play oh yeah that that's another one where you're gonna sink like fifty hours into yep but like beautiful game beautiful yep. animations yep this one just shows it on like a two D pane where like golden yep. sun shows it kind of in more of a three D environment but yeah it's it's a great game you know most of my strategy games that i got i get into like heroes of might and magic and things like that warcraft you know yeah the the console game rpg the console tactical rpgs didn't quite get me yet and i think it was just a, it was just a i never had the opportunity i, I would have gotten heavily into them if i played them back in the day and this, yeah, is, this a is a great first example. strategy type of rpg i played you know i played yeah. like your standard chrono triggers and earthbounds and like that kind of stuff. it's a different genre yeah yeah, but yeah, no. This one is highly addicting. It is hard to put down. Yep, it's a little rage inducing at times, but like it's a fantastic game. Yep, well, well worth going out of your way if you've never played a Fire Emblem game. Yep, and if you have played Fire Emblem, you could probably skip it because there's nothing. Like this is probably the most bare bones Fire Emblem you'll play that came out in, in uh, North America. Yeah, they they were just trying to get get us interested, and it succeeded. And it did. I yeah, think. it was yeah. great for yep. sure. And that then takes us on to the next one, uh, Fire Emblem, the Sacred Stones. Yeah, and just for a warning, I don't think we're going to talk about all the classes in this one because there's a shit ton. Yeah. But yeah. We'll, we'll definitely cover a few of them. Yeah. Um, so this one is a, I, I consider this one slightly a slight improvement. I think some people don't like it as much because it's easier. But I think the the parts where it's easier, it's mostly making improvements and smoothing things out. The, the music and graphics and HUD and everything are basically identical. Yeah. Basically the same engine. Uh, the gameplay and overall enjoyment to me is basically identical with some small tweaks. Um, I you know Some things are, are streamlined. The game seems to flow better. There's not quite so many super, super long fights that I had to repeat over and over again. I would say most of the fights in general are way shorter in yes. this one. Yes, which I think is a good thing. I think it was a little much with the previous one. Well, it is. Especially if you're one of those like perfectionists where you can't lose yes. a unit. Yes. It is so much easier to restart a mission in this game the the pre-promoted characters are actually useful in this one i don't think i found any pre-promote characters that were actually bad and you didn't want to use uh, I, I had a few of them that i used throughout the game yeah, i can't think great. of any that were like utter garbage you, so you didn't have the trap characters basically yeah. in this game that you did in the previous one um most classes now have branching promotion options my bad. I will say oh. Vanessa, the first Pegasus Knight you get, she is drastically stat wise worse than the other ones. Uh, was she a pre promote or did she? I was oh, talking no, about characters no, no, no. that are pre promote. I'm sorry. I know yeah. what you mean. Okay, yeah. like the Seth of the first game. Yes. Or whatever. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about characters that are pre promoted to their promote. I, I still yeah. didn't use that character in this yeah. game. I don't but even know who it was. I just th- there was there, there's a paladin that you get, <laughs> and it's he's kind of similar to the paladin in the last game, and I forget okay. which, what I, I had written his name. I, I, I threw him in the trash so quick it didn't even matter. But um, so the pre-promoted characters are useful. Um, most characters have branching promotion options. So some classes that weren't good, that wouldn't be good, they become good because one of their promoted classes is better than the other. Yeah. So, so you get a neat. choice in this game instead of just one class. You, yeah. I think everyone gets a choice of two. Just about. Uh, other than like yeah. the the lords, I like, think. Yeah. Uh, and then you have some classes that are that start out as a trainee class, and then they get a direct promotion to a journeyman class, and then they get a promotion to one of two options like everyone else yeah, does. Yeah, so they get, uh, what would that be, uh, 50 levels, I think, total? I, I forget. So I, I, mean, I, I got 10 the and here. then yeah. 1 to 20. Oh, I think you're 20. right. I think you're right, yeah. yes. And and, there, and at least one of them, uh, Ross, I think, is was really good. He the, is broken. The other yeah. two are debatable whether they're as good. They take a lot of effort, so it's up they, to you. They start out basically with, like, a one stat line and yeah. almost everything. Yeah. So, like, you have to beat somebody down to like one or two HP yeah. and then hope that this trainee unit will actually kill them. So some of them are bad. Yep. So like Ross starts with a hatchet, which yep. is 
a unique weapon for only him yep. that has like a hundred percent hit chance yep. always, and it deals like usually it's like he gets pretty quick, pretty fast, so it deals like three to six damage. Yeah. It's doable to promote him pretty easily, and, and this game then adds. Uh, other ways to to level people up. So you have the arena, which works basically the same way as the previous game, especially yeah. for making money. But you also get the tower, which is a a place on the map. This game now has a map where you can move around in different directions. Sometimes yeah. you have some. It's not a fully linear. So it's like a board game board, kind of. Yeah, mm-hmm. and you can sometimes go to the tower. You can go to skirmish with with enemies that are wandering around on the map, and you can get XP. And, and you can go to shops. And you can go to shops. And so, yeah, you have all this stuff you can do on the world map. Uh, yeah, you don't have to shop in the middle of a level like, yeah. you, had, like you did oh in the previous God, game. Oh, that was so hard. And so it's it's just it's so much smoother. You can you can actually level your characters up uh, outside of us. You know, you save your game, and then you level them up at the tower of the skirmish. If you screw up, you reset it, and you don't have to redo the level and the skirmish right. and the tower. You know, you, it's so much, it makes so much more sense for leveling up characters. Yeah, it's much more streamlined. It's not so, so much tedious. easier to do. I actually did play this entire playthrough of Sacred Stones on the hard mode because mm-hmm. my, you know, I had the completed save file from the last time I played it. Right. What I gotta say is it's definitely not very hard. Right. I mean, it's it's uh, if you play hard mode in the first Fire Emblem, it is ungodly difficult. Yeah. I, I had to stop and restart on normal mode. Yeah. Uh, this one, like, I don't know, like the enemies. I don't. I think maybe they just hit harder. Maybe they're slightly smarter, but like. Yeah. Eh, it was. I mean, it was pretty easy. Still, yeah. I, I think if if you really need the hardest, uh, you know, gameplay possible, that might frustrate you about this. I don't. There there are options to make it harder, but I don't think it ever gets anywhere near as hard as the previous. Yeah, or one. if you want to try to use certain units. There's a neat yeah, thing. Can, there, there's a supply wagon you get at the beginning of the game now that follows along your main hero, your main lord, uh, or either of your main lords. I think, and unlike in the previous game, you had to set it. You had to set the guy on the map and he could get destroyed by enemy units and you had to worry about him and you had to race back to him to like trade items and do things like that. Here you just follow your lord around and you can do all that. So he turns into a supply wagon in the first game, right? Uh, After it reaches like level 10 or whatever. I never never leveled him up all the way. Like level 20, he becomes like an actual movable unit or whatever. He becomes basically a movable wagon in the mission. Not like you ever use it, but... Well, so yeah, I, the only way I ever used him was the the mo- immobile uh, tent thing. Sure, and and I never leveled him up enough to to get out of that. I'll give you a hint: in hard mode, you have to use him as a meat shield because <laughs> all the enemies actually target him first. Yes, so yes. it's like you you throw him out in the open and yeah. you just you try to kill everything that attacks it. Yeah, I, I, I that's an interesting concept, but I like the way they handled this one better because yeah. it's just less tedious. Uh, like we mentioned, the overworld map and the, the skirmishing and everything. Uh, you have options for restocking on the overworld. Uh, just a lot of a lot better over a lot of better organization. I think I did find myself a lot more broke in this game. I don't yes. know about you, but well, yeah, I, I did some arena abuse before I realized <laughs> yeah, the other well, stuff. Yeah, that'll do it. And that's the main reason that I I I started running out of money. Like at the very end of the game, I had yeah. to start selling stuff off to buy the last few things I needed for the few levels. If I had done a little more abuse, I would have been fine. If you don't arena abuse at all, you're probably going to be scrounging for money a bit or having to do tower runs or something. Yeah, there, there's a couple things you can do to get money in the yeah. game. Uh, uh, there is a hidden silver card somewhere. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. remember what level it is, but you basically have to find it, and then it gives you half off in the shops for the character that's holding the card. There, there's a card that you get from the one guy, from one one of the thief characters later on that lets you go into the secret shops. Yeah, the, the gold card. Yeah, the gold card. I think you can use that together with the other thing to save the money. Yeah, I didn't mention that. The, both games have these secret shops in certain levels that if you move a certain character into a certain place, you get to buy You would only items. know it by reading a guide. Yeah, it's not something you yeah. would accidentally find but so that you can get a lot of powerful items if you have the money uh again if you're not abusing the arena or something you probably won't have enough money to buy a lot but you could get a couple useful things yeah yeah no i i thoroughly enjoyed this one uh you can also go to the tower i think state or level three has a chest that always has three thousand gold in it i mean if you're like desperate yeah but uh yeah, as far as like easeability, like I think I enjoyed this game a little bit more, yeah. although it does have some things that are just obviously a little bit worse. Yeah. It is subjectively worse though. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's it's like okay, you're not like pigeonholed into using certain units like you are in the first game. Like yeah. the first game it's like okay, you either want to use these units or you don't. In yeah. the second game, 
You can grind out an entire party to promote his level 20 if you want. Yeah, and that's the thing. You, you There's not a limited amount of XP in this game. Yeah. You can you can promote everybody if you want. You can level up everybody and then switch between different characters yeah, and, for different And apps. they give you the, the promotion items to do yes. for everyone, too. And they're not, like, yes. hit, super hard to find. They're, like, out in the open. Yeah, some of them you might have to be careful that you don't accidentally miss them, you know, on a certain level. Yeah, if you read yeah. a guide. I mean, yeah. but like, most of the levels, like, you visit, visit all the houses and yes. you'll find it. Like, yep. Yep. They're not that bad. You don't have to do a lot of stealing from enemy units in this game like you did in the previous enemy. one. Yeah. yeah. There's maybe one map where you can steal. Uh, there's like uh, two bosses on either side of the map. And if yeah. you steal from one, you can get like a uh, something that will protect your flyers from arrows. And yeah. the other one protects you from critical hits. Yeah. And there's uh, this game. You don't really need a thief as much because you can actually buy door keys and chest keys on the world map. I still used it, but you can use them, but you don't have to, which yeah. is nice. You have the option to just not bother with a thief if you don't want one. Well, the thief can't just open chests, so they get the pick or the pick lock or whatever. They have to use a lock pick. Yeah, a lock pick. Which is cheaper and, and like 15 uses or whatever. Than yeah. Keys. So it's like, OK, the lock pick is great, but you can also promote and you you wouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. But you get a unit later in the game that's a rogue who mm-hmm. doesn't need a lockpick anymore. He can uh, just go steal your stuff. Yeah, but you'd rather have an assassin. <laughs> you'd better, rather have an assassin, which yeah. is the other class that a thief can involve into. Well, and the, like the assassin's actually pretty good in this playthrough. I like yeah. it. Um, if you want, we can very briefly go through uh, just stuff on there's, classes. There's a couple new classes. A couple yeah. of them I didn't really get to try. Yeah. So like, there's a. I mean, I'm trying to think. So like, I use the Ross trainee, I turn him into a pirate, then a berserker. So yep. he kept his uh, train ability to be able to, to go through terrain. Uh, and he's also probably the best unit in the game for me again. Yeah, so they basically, they, they kind of combined the, the MOOC classes I mentioned from the previous ones yeah. are pretty much, you have the fighter, uh, warrior, both can turn into a hero or a berserker. And, and the berserker I thought was actually slightly better. And yeah, the one trainee can turn into that. The archer is still mostly bad, but you could turn him into a ranger that isn't bad. So that was nice. Yep. Um, the Myrmidon can turn into a swordmaster or an assassin. The thief can turn into a rogue or an assassin. Both cases, the assassin. I th- actually no, I think the swordmaster was slightly better, but the assassin was slightly better for the thieves. Yeah, I'm trying to think. That the was swordmaster. I'm trying to find it in this list. The swordmaster does give you a flat fifteen percent or fifteen percent crit rate. So yeah, the swordmaster was a little better in combat, but the assassin was close to as good, but could still use do some could do still do some of the thiefy things. The assassin gives you that silencer skill, yes. which it's just nice. Every now and then, it just straight up assassins yeah. or assassinates people and yep. I'm, I'm trying to like look it up and see what it exactly does yeah i think it was it's just it's it's kind of like a, a more powerful crit but less often kind of man this fire emblem site sucks i, I think so. the, the the sword master was more consistently good um the pegasus knight could turn into a falcon knight or a wyvern knight uh so you could you could turn all your pegasus knights into wyvern knights and have them actually be tough <laughs> and your Wyvern Riders could, could be Wyvern Knights or Wyvern Lords. Um, you know, I I, had, I ended up with four or with three Wyvern Knights and and one one Falcon Knight, and I loved it in this game. So, yeah, uh, I made the mistake. Um, so what I wanted to do was have three Pegasus Knights because yeah. I, I think you can use a, a special move that this, only they can do called yes. Triangle Attack, yes. which I've never actually used in any Fire Emblem game, nope. but it's in like every Fire Emblem game. Yeah, never, I, never tried. I've always heard it's basically trash anyway. Yeah, it's too but, much effort, too much setup. <laughs> yeah, what, what I was doing one night, I was like, I was kind of falling asleep while playing it, so I just kind of turned it off. The next yeah. day, like, I turned it back on, and what I was what I was going to do right beforehand was. Uh, uh, promote my i think her name is tana yeah basically the really good early pegasus knight that you get she's got like a ridiculously high strength stat for yep. pegasus knight yep so i was gonna promote her to a waiver knight but yep. i totally forgot yeah and i promoted her to a falcon knight ah uh, yeah so like she maxed out her strength stat within like five level ups yep yep so like for 15 levels she's basically like worthless yep yep so big big mistake i did look up the silent skill yeah so in this game, uh, for an assassin, you have a fifty percent chance of your crit doing an instant kill. Oh, okay, that's what it was. So okay. if you so if you use like here. a a sham shear, yeah, or sham shear, basically you have a thirty percent chance of insta kill. Sure, sure. Uh, so then you get the the knight uh, general or the cavalier paladin. Uh, or sorry, the, the knight could go to either general or great knight, and the cavalier can go to either paladin or great lord, great knight. Yeah. And so it, they kind of you have a few more options with those classes. You could basically take the knight ty- type, or and instead of making him a general, you can make him a great knight, so they're a little more mobile. 
which I thought was good. And the paladin is basically the same as it was before, you know, the paladin or, or great lord or what have you. And like they're all broken anyway. They're all so good. It doesn't really matter. They're all good. They, you have more more options. Yeah. The mercenary can go to a, either a hero or a ranger. Again, the ranger class is cool. I liked the ranger. I, I uh, made mine into a ranger yeah. this way through, and he ended up being like my best unit. Yeah, I loved him. He was great. He was so good. They, they removed the nomad trooper entirely. That was gone. Yeah. They, uh, as I said, they added the journeyman recruit pupil type. Um, the I didn't. I actually didn't bother at all with the shaman class in this game because it came super late in the game. I did. Yeah. Um, so I turned Ewin, that little recruit character. I turned him into a shaman. Ah, okay. It was fine, but like none of the like. You didn't really need it. I don't. Think. No, you didn't need it at yeah. all. Like he, yeah. he still ended up being like. It's a little too squishy to throw into the middle of units. Yep. But like he did no discernible difference in damage from like any of the other mages. Yep. And then the other mages, then you had like monk and priest that can turn into bishop or sage, and you had mage that can turn into sage or mage knight, mage knight, and you had cleric or uh, cleric that could turn into bishop or valkyrie, and trumpeter that trumpeter that could turn to valkyrie or mage knight. There's so many options. Yeah. I ended up with a bunch of mage knights. I think mostly because those were pretty cool. I thought, but I don't think I ended up with any. But yeah, I mean, they're the, the, good. The, there's just so many options, yeah. and they all seemed pretty decent. So, uh, dancer remained essential in this game. Uh, Mana Heat was a new class they had in this game, which is basically a dragon person who gets. Oh right, right, right. And it was right. that that single character who has a single fifty use weapon, and she's the most overpowered character in the game. But again, you literally have fifty attacks with her, and then she's done. And so I ended up giving her the scroll thing that gives her more XP. And again, you get her like three quarters of the way through the game. Yeah, you wasted the fuck out of that scroll, but I probably did. But the the, the <laughs> point the point being is not even really trying with her. As soon as I got her, I put her in, and I and I didn't overuse her too much. And the fifty was just about enough to get her through the game. And she was level twenty without me even really trying and dominating everything I put her at. Uh, she was great. Yeah, I basically threw her into like the fifth floor of the tower, yeah. and everything there gave her a free level. Up. Yeah, you, and she couldn't die anyway, so it didn't matter. Yeah, you basically you want I think you want like twenty or thirty uses left of her item for the last few stages in the game, and you don't even really need that. You you, don't, you only yeah. need like five for the boss if you just right. want to do well, it. Well, yeah, you could save her for the boss, but yeah. like I said, if you want to actually use her. You wanna then you wanna have so many things for her to use in the level and not not use them because you can't ever buy more. Once yeah. she's done, she's done. I had her just maxed out. So the, like the last level is just like I just throw her in the middle. It didn't matter. Yeah, she's she could almost one shot the final boss. It was it was pretty. I think wild. she could like two shot him. I yeah, ended up basically. using my ranged or my uh what do they call the class? The archer uh that the warrior turns into? The the we ranger. Right? About yeah, the ranger. Yeah. I ended up using him with the yes. uh, with the best bow that you get, and he two turned the final boss, so just him alone. So. Yeah, that was one thing. It was probably a little too easy at the very end to just destroy the boss with the with certain. Characters. It is, and my classes weren't even close to maxed out. They yes. were probably like level eight promoted. Uh, yeah, I, I promoted mine mostly at level 15. Like, I was reading people were saying, don't promote at level 10 because they'll be weak. But if you wait till level 20, it's not you're not it's not going to be worth it. You're going to be too far into the game. So promote at level 15. It's a good happy medium. I, I 20 Yeah. And, like, th that's why it's like, yeah, I, my most of my classes are, like, level 8 to 10, I think. It's much yeah. more doable in this game because it's easy to level them up in the tower and the, the skirmishes. And oh, stuff. yeah. So I just I, figured I'm like, I'm already could. unstoppable. It doesn't matter. Like, I, yeah. I completed the last level of the tower, like, without losing anything. Yeah. So, and, mm. and and the lords in this game are great. You know, there's nothing. Wrong yeah, they're both pretty broken. So, yeah, I, I, I loved this game. I consider this a 4.5. It's very nearly perfect. I would definitely play it again. There's other modes to complete. I definitely want to play a harder difficulty. About the only thing I gave it any ding for was, like I said, the difficulty, and they might have overcorrected a little bit, made it a little too easy, and I thought the the, the sound was just a little too average. Like, I, I, I really yeah. like to have a good, memorable soundtrack for a game like this. Uh, you, you won't get that in any Fire Emblem no. games, just FYI. Yeah, so maybe I'm asking too much, but it, barring that, it was just about a perfect game. Again, if you don't need super, super high difficulty. Yeah, like I, I'll give it a five just because, like, yeah, I, eh, I, I really like uh, it. I give it a, like a four point seven five. Like, I hate doing that shit, but yeah. like, yeah, it, my my big gripes were like, so ha most of the enemies in the game are monsters this yeah. time around. Yes, and I just have a couple gripes with that because one, they're so easy. Yeah, uh, most of them. Yeah. Most of, there's most like a couple that might be hard, but yeah, for the most part, they're so easy that like you're barely ever in danger. Yeah. 
Uh, and then, like, two, their animation takes forever. Mm-hmm. Like, those zombie animations, yeah. that, like, it takes them, like, ten seconds to attack you. Mm-hmm. So if you want to see the cool graphics of this game, like, you basically can't use it during the monster mode. I pretty much turned it off anyway, but yeah. Yeah. But I think well, I, I did, yeah. too, but I'm like... Sometimes I got the like the S ranked items of the game, and I'm like, mm-hmm. hey, I kind of want to see what this animation looks like, and they're sweet. Yeah, or like the final boss, I turned on animation for him because yeah. like he looks pretty cool. Yeah, but yeah, and I think there was a separate. Isn't there a separate mode for using monsters and stuff? There in is, this? and I yeah. haven't played it. Yeah, I need to play it, but yeah, like it looks neat. But it looks yeah, neat. I haven't. Yeah, I pretty much finished that. I looked at the time that it took to finish that, and I'm like, whoop, got to move. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, great game. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's go to the Shining Force franchise, Dave. Yeah. There's, there's definitely not as much to talk about for this, so... There's not. I thought we could talk briefly about the history, because, again, after playing through this, I wanted to see where it lined up with the, the Fire Emblem games. So it basically started out... Well, it actually started out with other Shining games, Shining Into the Darkness and so forth, totally different genre, and then Shining Force was an offshoot from that and was the mm. first one that was a tactical RPG. And it was released in March of 1992 on the Genesis uh, with Max from the Kingdom of Guardiana, which sounds like a safety woman from uh, MS from that one Rift Tracks, uh, leading the Shining Force against Kane from the Kingdom of Rune Faust and Dark Soul and Dark Dragon and Dark whatever dark else. whatever Dark yeah. Wizard Dark, dark Mick Evil Bad yes Chaos Dragon <laughs> Bad <laughs> Bad Mick Enemy Type. Well, we'll get to that. Uh, so that's the first game. Then you get Shining Force Gaiden, which was also in 92 on the Game Gear, uh, which was actually, I think, the second game. You had, you had mentioned earlier the first two, and this one actually came uh, next, uh, which features Nick from the Kingdom of Guardiana uh, leading the Shining Force against uh, another kingdom of Cyprus, I believe. This one's like a 20-year afterwards uh, with some of the same characters, some children of them, etc. Okay. Uh, Shining Force Gaiden 2, uh, the Sword of Hajia, which uh, took place in 93 on the Game Gear, uh, which is Diana from the Kingdom of Cyprus from the previous game against a different kingdom of Ayum, uh, follows directly from Gaiden 1. Uh, then you get Shining Force 2, also in 1993, which features Bowie from the Kingdom of Grand Seal, leading the Shining Force against the Kingdom of Galam and the Demon King Zeon. Which originally didn't have anything to do with the first game, but uh, released in 1995, you got Shining Force Gaiden Final Conflict, uh, which came out on the Game Gear, Japan only, although some English patches exist, which features Ian from the Kingdom of Guardiana leading the Shining Force to rescue the former leader, Max, from... Mishael, who is the chief servant of Dark Soul, and the whole storyline of this game apparently serves to loosely link the stories of Shining Force One and Two. Eh, it, it, you could argue, I mean, yeah, cool. Like if you're a fan of Shining Force, I'm sure it's awesome. Uh, some people say that you have to kind of retcon Shining Force One quite a bit to make it fit. Like certain characters uh, are apparently different than what they represented themselves as. Bloody bloody whatever. I think maybe I probably didn't pay enough attention yeah. to the story of either one of these games, but we'll get into that. But yeah, there, I could same with Fire Emblem, by the way. I could see that, well, especially this game. But yeah. we'll we'll get there. Then you get Shining Force uh, CD released in 1994 on the Sega CD. So technically before. For the last one. Uh, this one is basically a remake of the two Gaiden games, one and two on the Game Gear, but had some additional scenarios. It sounds like this is probably the better way to play those uh, if you have the ability to play stuff on a Sega CD. Yeah, very expensive game. I know that yeah. for sure. Yeah, probably something better to play with a, a flash card or what have you. Oh, yeah. Um, then you got Shining Force 3, released in uh, December of 97 in Japan only and 98 in, in the US on the Saturn which is broken up into three scenarios. Apparently, some of the scenarios uh, were only released in Japan, which is interesting. I think it might have gone, uh, been released over uh, their the uh, modem or something. Oh, okay. I, th- I can't remember if that... I think, did they have a Sega service yet on the Saturn? I forget. <laughs> apparently, this was... Uh, apparently, this these extra scenarios were released somehow only in Japan. Did I they have a modem thing on the Saturn? I, thought, I, I know it has a modem. I don't remember if they had a okay. service like they did on the Dreamcast. I, I know Jack shit about Saturn. So. I actually, no, I, I know they had a service on the, the Genesis already, because remember they had... Uh, they had that Mega Man game and stuff. You so, talking about the Sega Channel? Yeah, the Sega Channel. Yeah, that thing I, was I, awesome. I think that existed in some form on the Saturn as well. I need to look it up. But. Did, did you ever know somebody that had the Sega Channel? No. Oh, I had a buddy that had it. No. Oh, it was great. Yeah. It was the greatest. 
Anyway, uh, Shining Force 3 it serves as a sequel to Shining the Holy Ark, which is one of those first-person RPGs that I mentioned, which was on the Saturn. Uh, and uh, then finally you get Shining Force Feather, which was released in 2009 on the DS, which I wasn't even aware existed. So, I think, is that Japanese only, I think? Um, I don't think so. I think it actually came out here, but I don't think I ever heard about it. Because there's some uh, there's Shining Force games on the Game Boy Advance, I know. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I didn't... Shining. I didn't. Oh. I didn't find those in my notes, but they must be remakes of some of the. Uh, yeah, I think I did read that there were some remakes. Yeah, of, there's like Resurrection of the Dark Dragon and something else. Though those are remakes of the Shining Force One and Two, I think. Oh, that sounds cool. Then I should yeah try to find them. Yeah, it'd be interesting to compare those against the GBA Fire Emblem games. Yeah, I, I've heard. Uh, I I think I did briefly look into those, and I I didn't. They didn't get in my notes here, but I I thought I heard some people saying that. They they might prefer the Genesis version in some way, but oh, you know, we'll okay. have to see. So usually everything is better once it's ported. Yeah, <laughs> Game I, Boy Advance. I'm not sure if that's the case or not, yeah. but I, okay. I, I'll have to try it out at some point and see. So that leads us to Shining Force One on the Genesis, uh, developed by Climax Entertainment or Camelot Software Planning, and published by Sega. Yeah, this is one of those games where it's like, okay, uh, I, one afternoon I was just looking like, I kind of want to try a Sega RPG. I don't know if I've ever played one in my lifetime. So yeah. I'm like... They did I, have a lot. Uh, yeah, I was looking between like Fantasy Star. I was looking at the wall yeah. right here. I'm like, yeah. okay, there's Fantasy Star. Like that looks pretty generic, whatever. Yeah, people like it. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like whatever. And then I picked up Shining Force and I'm like... Man, I got to make a, a decision. I'm like, <laughs> you know, Shining Force, it just sounds cooler. So I'm sure. like, screw it. I want to play it. And then I, I popped it in, man. I got kind of hooked on it, to be honest. Like, sure. I had a lot sure. of fun with it. Sure. And sure, th- like, this wasn't right after I played, like, an entire Fire Emblem franchise. Yes. <laughs> so, like, you know, I don't, I didn't have rose-colored, you know, roads tinted it, glasses by any means. But. It's not fair to compare it. Because, again, this it's came not. out way it's, first. It's really, like, a stupid <laughs> idea to do this. But, like, whatever. It, it is what it is. But Realistically, this came right out. At, this came out fairly soon after the NES game. <laughs> right. So, it's like, yeah, if we're comparing. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure this is blows the NES game out of the water, but yeah. Yeah. No, like I, I booted this up. I started playing it. I'm like, wow, this is like a really cheerful, fun little strategy grid based RPG. Sure. Sure. And it's like, yeah, the story is super generic, but like you get so many characters. Like how many characters are there? Like one, two, three, four, five. It's like 30 it's, characters or something. that many. I thought it was closer to like 20. Uh, no, right. there's like 30. I, I mean, you mostly only use like 12 at a time, right? Well, right. I mean, so, like, there is some definite gotcha yeah. characters in this game. Yeah. Which, you know, there were with the first Fire Emblem too. but... I felt like this one had more of a cutesy cartoon aesthetic. Not really terrible. Maybe a little dated, but, you know. It, it kind of reminds me of, uh, like, Lodos War. Yeah. Like that kind of art a little, style. Well, a little, yeah, like, a little, not as cool looking, but... Yeah, a little like cutesier. A, yeah, yeah, a little cutesy version of it. It's kind of an interesting mix of fantasy races, uh, you know, centaurs and things like that, and elves yeah, and you're, Archers, centaurs. Yeah. I mean, maybe, it's maybe a more generic feeling threat, uh, you know, like dark soul, dark, dark soul. wizard, dark, whatever. Like, yes. I don't even remember what the story was at all. Yeah. So the part of the problem is I think the storyline, it, it feels poorly written, but I think it was just mangled in translation. Definitely could have been. Yeah. It feels like there's a germ of a good story there, but then you have, you have big bads called dark soul and dark dragon. <laughs> and the main cities are called guardiana and protectora. To Which, be fair, I think yeah. the, the end boss of the first Fire Emblem game that we played was like Fire Dragon. I, I don't mean, think it was anything I special. think it was a Fire Dragon. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like it's whatever. a generic enemy. Whereas here they they gave it they gave it a generic bad the name. The Shadow but, Bad Guy. Like, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Uh, part of the problem I have is is characters in this game kind of join up or change sides for no reason. There's not really any complications for getting people to join yeah. your team. They just do. You walk into a town and you say yeah. hello to, this, to some guy and he's like, eh. Sure. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go with you guys. Yay, Shining Force! <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah, I've Shining heard of the Shining Force. Force. I'm joining. Yeah, uh, there's no real dialogue between your characters. No, you know, it's you're pretty much. It's kind of like the equivalent of like Dragon Quest or something, where you're just yeah, playing. Much. You're playing your big, your main hero, and you just have a bunch of mooks following you. Yeah, and you can swap yeah. them in and out of your party as you want. Like, yeah, it's fine. I kept confusing the big bad Dark Soul and his Lieutenant Kane. They're two yeah. different yeah. armored masked yeah. guys. I did too, and I kept confusing them. Um. On that note, uh, spoiler, uh, least impactful character death ever, that being Kane. <laughs> I don't, dude, I don't even remember. Yeah, it, it was supposed to be this big dramatic moment, and I was just like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares? He's dead. I don't care. <laughs> 
Uh, the gameplay to me felt a little clunky and basic. Again, it sure compares very well. Actually, I played the NES version a little. I think it compares very well to that. To but, the first Fire Emblem? Yeah, or yeah. even, even the, the, the the Super Nintendo one that came a year later. Sure. But compared to something like the GBA game, oh, it's super clunky. It is, yeah. It's clunky <laughs> as hell. There, there's Which just, isn't fair, but... There's some like simple things that just kind of suck. Like, the menuing is just bad. Yes. Like, I don't even know how to explain it. Like, Every tap of any it's button you do goes laggy. in and out of menus. Yeah. Yeah, the the, the menus pop up, like, yes. strangely. Uh, they don't always make sense, either. You kind of have to, like... Yeah. interpret some of the menuing as there, there's a lot less along. there's a lot less detail like when you attack something it doesn't give you a pop-up say these are your stats and these are your enemies yeah stats. you only know by experience yeah like, you just, I don't know, have i done this before what's gonna happen there's a, there's a lot of things you can't just look and see stats of weapons and things in the menu you have to look stuff up on a guide to figure out what something's gonna do that, that's a, a big of, problem the items yeah. like you we're using an item we're trying to figure out is this a healing item or an mp healing item i don't know it doesn't say and even I, the guide has it wrong yeah. And you're just yeah. like, what the fuck? Yeah. So uh, you have stuff. There's, there's not really. There's not a rock paper scissors system. There's not a rescue mechanic. There's, there's not really. There's not counterattacks in this game, if I recall correctly. I think there was. Maybe there was. It was random. Was. If it was, I know. I know there was in the second game. Um, this game, you do start getting multiple attacks eventually, but it's it seems random. Uh, yeah, I don't. You just. You, I don't know, you it's just not, pray. A little it's bit. not like the pre. It's not like the Fire Emblem games where someone with a high speed, you can assume they're going to get more attacks. Well, you see a times two, and you're like, yeah. okay. It's a double attack. Yeah, here mm-hmm. it's just kind of, it seems kind of random. I think it's random. The order that units act in seems to be random. I don't know if that's, is that based on agility or no? It doesn't, uh, it, there's, I, I honestly don't know. It might be partially, but it's also partially random. I should have probably like looked at the manual, but. Because, because eh. like in Fire Emblem, you just, you have all your units and you move them all at one time. Then all the enemy units move and then your guys move kind of, th- or, or their guys kind of go in between some of yours, but in 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 this game it's completely ran it seems completely random at least the enemies do because like sometimes enemy units get multiple attacks in between your guys before you guys have time yeah. like you move your guy out to attack he gets an attack in and then he gets swarmed and killed before you have a chance to do anything yeah and sometimes. there's terrain bonuses that don't yeah. quite make sense to me yeah like if you're in a forest and fire at moment it just straight up says it gives you like one defense and 20 avoidance so you know yeah. what it does yeah. in this game it, it'll say like 30 percent up in the top left and like what i can't tell what the hell it does but yeah the ai is kind of erratic sometimes it just chooses to do nothing sometimes it doesn't target your vulnerable units when it's, it could yeah and sometimes it'll just one shot whoever the fuck it feels like yeah it's it's really hard to know it's hard to predict it's it's like playing against somebody in a, in a video game that's bad like a, like a beginner who has yeah. no idea what they're doing yeah you don't really know what the ai is going to do you can't really predict what he's going to do which uh, is something, I guess. I it's it's. I see some. I've read some people that really like it because it's it's more random and stuff. I, I mean, I, like, I, the I more I like... play it, the more I don't mind it. But it does yeah. get frustrating sometimes, for yes. sure. Yes. Uh, but here's here's like one thing we have, we do have to mention though. Yeah. Your your uh, characters will die. Yes. They will die a lot, and it doesn't matter yeah, at all. Because you can resurrect them. Yes. I think they're in the second game at least, possibly the first. There might be a thing where it says how many times they died or whatever. Yeah, who but cares? It, who cares? It doesn't who matter. Cares um, there doesn't seem to be a way to speed up the text or the animations, so the delay can get kind of tedious, yeah. especially when you're repeating something. Yeah. Like I said, to me, the menus all seemed a little slow and laggy. The the startup sequence before when you're starting the game, you like can't I skip through it. I hate that. You, this, yeah. this 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 uh, elf girl is talking to you, and you're like, just shut up and let me get in the game. <laughs> I, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's a promotion system, which seems to make units actually weaker in the short term, but eventually stronger. So here's how promotions work in yeah. Shining Force yeah. 1. Is your, is, when you, can you promote? Is it 10 or 20? I think it's 10, I okay. believe. So you basically, can wait. Yeah, whatever it was. Like, yeah. your character gets to a certain level, and then you can promote them in Shining Force 1. Yeah. When they promote, basically all their stuff resets okay, yeah. to like whatever their new class level 1 is. Right. Which is usually decent. But like, let's say you're level twenty and yes. you and you promote, then all of a sudden your character is shittier. Yeah. So then like they build up really quick. Yeah. But like it might suck for a battle or two for sure. And in this game, there's a this is one of those games that's kind of like Fire Emblem where people will say, "Well, max out your character and then promote and then blah blah blah." But if you do that, you're going to be carrying around these new weapons that you've just got for for many battles that you can't use yeah. until you promote. So it's like the game is kind of telling you to promote at level ten, basically. Well, right? that's what I actually read yeah. in some guides where they're just like in Shining Force One, just promote as soon as you can. Yeah. In Shining Force Two, they actually keep their stats. Yeah. So to promote them basically whenever the hell you want yeah 
Um, there is, yes, yeah, so you said there's no permadeath, which is nice. The, the, the one result of that is your units feel a little more disposable. You're kind of like, oh, you, this is if this guy's a meat shield, I'm going to send him ahead oh, to yeah. take a hit. Yeah, those cavaliers <laughs> are going right out there. Those paladins, yeah. whatever they are, centaurs. Yeah. Um, I, I think the only real trouble I had in the game was early on with some of the unleveled units, if they weren't promoted yet. I, uh, sometimes, you know, I, like I'd have items that I could, couldn't could use yet until they were promoted. Mm-hmm. Though Those would be kind of weak, but other than that, I didn't really need much strategy in this game. You could kind of just just mow through things you kind of force your way through stuff yeah. yeah as long as you have one your one main character still alive you win so it doesn't matter um the game felt more like a jrpg like a dragon quest uh, yeah. a little more a little less strategy a little more rpg uh but but basic more basic a little more unfinished maybe like there's this deal menu in the shops which I think it doesn't we, make any sense. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. It's not completely unintuitive, but apparently it's it's where you can go to buy things that you miss out on somehow. Like you were supposed to loot the item, but you're full or or you dropped it or sold it or whatever. They I, make it seems to like make more of an impact in Shining Force 2, yeah. but yeah. Eh. But it's confusing both way, both games. Um some you have a bunch of items that are rarely useful. Uh you have a search option, but without like obvious places to search. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you're not searching, you know, pots and and cabinets so much. Very often you're just searching a random place. So th- this is definitely one of those yeah. like if you play it blind, you're going to miss a lot of yes. stuff. You almost really should use it. And you're gonna miss a lot of characters, including like the yes. best characters in the game, which yep. Yep. sucks. Yep. Uh, there's some things I definitely liked about this compared to the Fire Emblem style, like the AOE attacks for mage units. Like the the mages yeah. in this feel a lot more magey. The, they, they definitely do. They, they, in, the, in the other game, they just felt like ranged units. They're Here, basically they're like archers mages. with magic in the Fire Emblem. Yeah, basically. Um, the I, the um, the way you have weapons with that don't break for one thing. Yeah, which and, is cool. Which is nice. Yeah. I mean, it's a different style of game. Uh, and you have what more way of weapons with usable spells. Which, you don't always use them a lot, but it's neat to have the option when you run out of magic yeah, or whatever. I, I equate it to, like, the Final Fantasy 1 weapon system where some yeah. of them are just on use, whatever. I, I never used them. They, they, they do have a chance of breaking, so you have to be careful. Yeah, they, they do a thing where they're smoking or they burn up or whatever, and you can lose them. Well, is that what the repair option's for in the shop, Yes, though? Okay. I think so, yes. I, I've never once used them, so who yeah, cares? Yeah, because you've had, I've had cases where I had an item that smoked and then you could repair it, and I've had cases mm. where it, it broke on the first use. And it's gone? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it can, it can suck. Um, the buff and debuff spells are interesting, but I don't know. Personally, I kind of thought they were too short lived, but uh, some of them are, are pretty effective. I, I don't I think. recall if I used a lot of them in Shining Force One. There's yeah. one like that uh, Razor Agility lot, I thought that was. Yeah. Again, I don't really know what Agility does in any of these games. It's hard to tell in this one because yeah. it doesn't give you a lot of detail. The, the the variety of monster units was interesting in this. I think that's yeah, not bad. I, it was maybe a little more interesting than even like the, the second Fire Emblem game we played because like yeah. the, the the monsters are a little more different in in, in their their attacks and other things. I think and they all look cool. Like they it's, look it's cool, nicely yeah. drawn or whatever you want to yeah. say on screen. There's not a whole lot of animation going on, but yeah, doesn't matter. But yeah, the the art and stuff is interesting. Um, there's kind of an unofficial training system in this game where you you can flee from a battle and you keep all the XP you earned, then rinse and repeat. Yep. So you pick a level, a, a stage where you're pretty well set, but you have some characters that need to catch up and you just repeat it uh, however many times till you feel comfortable. Yeah, it's a good, on. easy way to grind. It's not too... doesn't take too long either. Yeah, and, and even, especially healer, healers in this game get a lot more XP. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they, they might not get enough, but they get more, so it's a little easier to catch up with them. They're basically constantly healing. Yeah. So. I, I still feel like they get less XP than the fighter types do, but it's easier to catch them up in this than well, it is. They do, that. because the fighter yeah. types can gain, like, 40 to 50 yeah. at a point, like, especially yeah. when you're in a new area. The healer's basically always capped at, you know, like, 10 or 12. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, that's 10 or 12 every turn where, yeah, eh, your fighters don't really get there. Yeah, I, I, this one I'm less likely to play again. I think and now that I beat it, I think I'm probably done. Um, I might try one of the alternate versions, maybe. Uh, yeah, I think it would be interesting to go back and try to play it with some of the characters that like you just completely avoided. But like mm-hmm. then you're playing it basically on hard mode. Yeah, I, I think uh, the over the overall presentation I think was fine for the era, but to me the graphics and sound were average at best. I mean, I. I I'm not a huge Sega fan, Sega Genesis fanboy, so that's probably part yeah. of it. Uh, again, the gameplay felt a little clunky and unfinished. The the terrible writing and translation bothered me. 
uh, to kind of took me out of the narrative entirely. Uh, it doesn't help that only a couple of the characters seem to matter at all in the storyline. Um, like why, like you give them names, but no personalities. So it's basically it's kind of, just the main character in Shining Force one. Basically. Yeah. It's kind of like, I'm, why, I'm looking at a character list right now and I'm like, I don't, it's, it's like they're there and you can talk to them and they have a canned response, but yeah. like, why give them a name if you're not going to give them any personality? It's kind of weird, but well, you know, whatever I, I, I wanted to not bash it too much, but I still think I'd give it a 3.5. Oh, I definitely give this one a four just because like once you get playing it, it like for me, like I never really got super bored. Mm-hmm. There's, there's some things that bother me, but like yeah. it's core gameplay. It's not bad. And it's, it's pretty fun. It's definitely not bad. It just didn't hook me as much as the Fire Emblem games did. Yeah. I, yeah. I think I liked just the massive amounts of characters that you can choose from. Sure. Like, sure. Uh, for example, uh, you get like a, a hidden character Gort early on that you can miss, yeah. which actually sucks. Yeah. So like, there's no backtracking at all in this game. It's kind of like Illusion of Gaia. I don't yeah. know if you ever played that on Super Nintendo. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But there's zero backtracking you can do. So if you miss something, oh yeah, it's this gone. one's super linear, especially this, compared to the second one. Yeah. I mean, the second one's basically yeah. open world. This one's yeah. just like, yeah, you can miss Gort early on. You can yeah. miss. Um, you can miss uh, Musashi, which is like the, one of the best yep. characters in the game. Yep. yep. You might be able to miss Hanzo. I don't remember. I think you might. I think you can miss both of those two. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like yeah. you can make the game harder by not recruiting certain characters, or yeah. you can recruit these busted ass characters, but you do have to kind of grind out a few levels before they're good. Yep. yep. So I don't know. I kind of like that aspect. There are definitely a bunch of characters that are just shit, and yep. like you really should never waste your time leveling them. I remember uh, Jogurt. Or yogurt, whatever the hell his name was. It's oh like yes, the, the little yes. like mole or something. He is literally, a, literally a joke character. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the Shiny Force Two has almost a similar thing. And this him. one, they added you could level that guy up and get an item from him to make your other characters look like him. <laughs> So like yeah, so they could get uh, it's a hat or something I forget, and that they could equip and it makes them look like them like him or whatever, but they still get their normal. So you could like have the look of him, but still have a useful character. Sounds amazing. (laughs) There are also like cosmetic items in Shiny Horse One that you can do and you could equip that would just just like change your character's outfit for like the battle scenes or whatever. Yeah, like the two female characters or two of them, whatever. Yeah, Uh, of course. Like I don't. It's something. It's 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 cute. Felt very Japanese, but yeah, yeah. So no, I, 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 I enjoyed this game a lot. So I will say, having given this a 3.5, uh, maybe I can do a bit of a spoiler that I actually considered Shining Force 2 an entire point up. Oh, yeah. And Shining I, Force I, 2 is great. I, I, I will give that a 4.5. I yeah. do think it's it's actually a way better game. I just it 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 lost a lot of the clunkiness that the first game had. It did. It it Yeah, it. Fix up a lot of the. I, I would say a lot of the menuing is actually the same, but like for some reason it just feels a little it bit just better. Just smooth, runs smoother, yeah. Yeah, the the search options feel a little bit better. Yeah. Again, this is another guide game because there's a a bunch of items called mithril. Yes, that you can get early on in the game, and it's very missable. So yeah, some of them you cannot get back to if you don't if you don't get them at a certain time. Yeah, and not yeah. like you need all of them, but it definitely helps to have all, if not most of them. Well, you can't use them until super late in the game. Yeah, almost, so, almost like the last like fifth of the game or less. Yeah, the last the four, quarter of the game Sixth? at least. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This game to me felt like the difference between like Dragon Quest One and Dragon Quest Three. Sure, it's like a huge, huge improvement. Well, Dragon Quest 1 sucked. I, mean, I don't know. I, 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 I can't consider Shining Force 1 Dragon Warrior 1 or whatever. I, I'm just saying that the difference that between... Fucking sucks. The difference between the games to me is like... Sure, sure. Um, to, it, it feels much, much more like a cross to, between a JRPG and a strategy RPG yeah. to me. Even more so than number one. Uh, I think this performance was smoothed out. The graphics seemed more varied and impressive. Uh, I think the sprites were light years better. Yeah. The more animated... Um, the, I think the translation was slightly better, still not great. Yeah. The storyline was a little better. Uh, not so much generic McEvil names. Um, some, some no, badly like, translated lines. Yeah. There's there. like devils, but they all have their own little personalities and they all kind yeah. of bicker back and forth. Like it, it's interesting. It's, it's not better. Horrible. It's, it's better. The, the UI was a bit improved. Uh, you could check like the unit stats for all your units at once yeah. instead of having to go to the HQ and check them one yeah, by one. That was annoying. Yeah. With it. You can, you can talk and search with, without a menu option you just hit the button like you yeah. you you were later on the game you were doing a search thing you forgot that there was a separate button because you just well, used to hitting the apparently one there's a difference between a and c yeah. although you would never note it 
Yes. You well, never know. C is like the do all button, but yeah. there's certain cases where you need to push A instead to bring I up the menu. I don't get it. Whatever. Yeah, it's it's fine. Somebody didn't know how to code it, I'm it, sure. It, at least it, it felt better. It, it, it's, it felt more intuitive than, than number one. Uh, there was a little bit more involvement of the different characters. They had more personality. Not all of them, like a, a quarter of them, but some of them. Yeah, you have like kind of like side characters like uh, Peter, Peter, for example. Yeah. He's pretty important to the story. You have Slade, who kind of falls off later on. But yeah, yeah. The difficulty, I thought, uh, seemed a lot higher from the get-go. Well, like, there's different levels you can set. There is, but even... And, and it was apparently a little broken. It wasn't quite set up right, but e- even early on, the, the AI will punish you if you're careless. Oh, yeah. You, you should expect to lose units a lot more frequently, and that's just how it, how the game works. Uh, units randomly double attack, counter attack, etc. Uh, you have to kind of change your strategy. You, have, you need more of a buffer to avoid random deaths. You really do. Yeah, it, it is hard. You have to hide units. Yeah, uh, I, I'm playing on whatever people consider what the highest difficulty was. I don't remember which one I selected, but yeah. it's like basically there's like a, an easy mode, a normal mode. There's like a hard mode and a extreme or whatever. extreme or super hard mode, but like. They weren't that one's right. like broken. Yeah, where it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. So like you actually go with the third hardest mode, which is supposedly the hardest one. Yeah, I something guess. freaking weird like that. I don't know, but yeah. that's the one I'm playing on. But yeah, if you leave anyone out there, even a tank, sometimes they just get one shot. Yeah. Uh, I liked how they added the hate, the HQ from Signing Force One. They turned into a mobile caravan that you take with you, which, which is, is like nice. a big hermit crab, I guess. It, it's, it's, like a tank. Weird it's like a tank yeah. or something. But you can more easily change units on the fly and move gear around and all that stuff. So that was neat. Um, there were some remaining problems. Like I said, I thought it was still way too random. I, I personally prefer to have a better idea uh, in stats what's going to happen before oh, I send, send something in. and. You know, maybe some people just prefer the randomness. I get it. That's I don't fine. know if you can argue with it, whatever. Whatever. You're not going to argue with Sega fanboys. I've already yeah. learned that lesson. Uh, it's not going to happen. It's the, especially, it seems really <laughs> random what order units attack in. So sometimes you send somebody ahead and you think, okay, this guy's going to go next. Oh, no, three anime units are going to go first and destroy him. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea how that works. Yeah, it's it's weird. You, you, can't always exp- you, you can't always plan for how many attacks you have before that enemy unit's going to get another attack. No, what what I always just do is like, okay, this enemy just moved. That means I probably can move like this many characters before he moves again. But not always. Sometimes it just... Especially the bosses, sometimes they just have like insane priorities. They just double attack. Yeah, some units just get so many more turns than anyone else. So you have to like really hide the hero character. Because if he dies, like it's over, and then you lose half your gold on top of it, which sucks. Yeah, you don't want to use him anywhere that he has any chance of getting ganged up. Yeah, you you hide him from the boss unless there's like one hit left. Yep. And then you just pray he doesn't whiff. Yep. Uh, There's a lot of unique items that are way too easy to miss. Yep. uh, That drop from specific enemies, but. Uh, so th- when I first played this, I was like, well, this only, this item only drops from this enemy and only if the unit that kills them has an open inventory space. Right. But then I found out that, oh no, actually what happens is it goes into the deal option on the merchant so you can buy it later, but it doesn't tell you that it did that. Yeah. You so just you, have to know. You just have to know. You have to go in and check the deals thing in the merchant. Mind you, that did nothing in the previous game as far as I could tell. <laughs> I don't know. So I kept checking it, but I kept expecting to find nothing. And then all of a sudden I found something like, oh, this actually does something. <laughs> It was kind of annoying, but whatever. Um, there's a small number of more interesting fights, I thought. Like, there's the boss monsters, the chessboard thing. The, you know, yeah, the chessboard area was really cool. It's like, oh, honey, I shrunk my kids area. Yeah, there were some cool fights that were more interestingly oriented. You know, it wasn't just, just defeat everything. But, uh, not, but most of them, I think, were a little too generic and forgettable. You had a lot of random fights in the overworld that that weren't for any purpose. It was just a fight to have a fight. Which is sometimes nice if you're trying to grind, but sometimes super annoying if you're yes. just trying to move. It, it felt to me in Fire Emblem, it felt like every fight there was a point to it. Yeah, pretty much. Whereas in this one, there's a lot more just random boss r- or random uh, wilderness fights. Again, more of a Dragon Quest kind of you know fighting in the wild kind of thing. And Whatever. I definitely get lost in the open world of Shining Force too. And it's, there's no teleport. Yeah, there's yeah. no teleport. There's no in-game map, so it yes. is kind of hard to like, especially if you pick the game up a few days like after you've just been playing it. Yeah, it's 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 easy to have no clue where you're supposed to go next. Yeah. 
Uh, and then, and you said the mithril weapon system at the, at the end of the game was kind of neat, but the problem is every character has like three or four items that they can have made of mithril and it does, you don't get to choose. So you basically hand the guy a piece of mithril and said, make something for, for Sarah. And then he's like, and he says, come back later. So you have to res- reset the game or save her. Or I think you have to leave the town and come back. And then you talk to him and he says, okay, here's your item. And it could be the junky thing that you can buy in the store, or it could be the best item for her in the game. Yeah. And if it's not the best item for in the game, you reset and you try again <laughs> 50 more times till you get something decent. How much the, time did you spend? Oh, I spent at least a day or two getting just <laughs> oh, that, I God. swear. Because uh, it, it just, it's random. Uh, Maybe not a day or two, but I, I spent all of one afternoon at least oh, uh, going through that. It was, horrible. it was, te- again, it doesn't matter. You don't need it to beat the game, but, but they're the be- they're literally the best items in the game unless you take the cursed items, which have the curse built in. Like yeah, you, lose, you lose turns or something. You well, know? we forgot to even mention cursed items in the first game, too. But you don't want to use them. Who yeah. cares? Yeah, because, because, uh, I mean, you can uncurse your character and I think you keep the item, that, but if you, but if you equip it, it again, you get cursed. Again, so you- and you have a chance of just missing attacks and it's not, it's not worth using them. No. There's a game I was talking to you about, like, Lufia earlier, where there's yeah. a bunch of cursed items in the game. Yeah. They all have, like, mega stats, but again, like, if it only hits 20% of the time, why the hell would you ever use it? Yeah, it's not worth it. Uh, the only point I would see at all is if you, for some reason, missed all the mithril items somehow or something. <laughs> I mean, it, w- it would be hard to, or easy to miss about 50% of them. Right. If you didn't, if you don't have enough mithril... I could see maybe giving certain characters a cursed item and just assuming that that 20% of the time that you're going to get screwed over is, is worth less than the boost in stats. I still don't know that it would be, but eh, eh. you can, you can make that <laughs> choice, I guess. Uh, as for whether I would play this game or not, uh, I'm probably done with this one. I, it was worth playing through once, but I don't think it has as much replayability as the Fire Emblem games, for example. I don't think it does either, but like, the Fire Emblem games for me, it's, I'm pretty much done with Sacred Stones. I don't, and unless the monster mode is cool, I don't think I'll ever yeah. go back to it. Yeah. Uh, Fire Emblem One, the only reason I would go back to this is try hard mode, just because it's it's yeah. insane. But I, I'd see be willing, if I could do it. I'd be willing to play through the game on difficult, d- different difficulties. I don't know that I would bother with with this one as much well, as you've seen me playing on the different difficulties. Like yeah. you, shit just gets popped off right away, like for no reason whatsoever. Yeah, this is a much better game. I, I still think yeah. it's a four point five game, but it's not oh, yeah, necessarily sure. a game with replay value for me. Um, uh, the only thing I think it really loses points for is it's still a little clunky, still a little cheesy. The translation still like, it's, it's pretty close to a perfect, you know, gay RPG of its type, but it's, yeah, it's just a little clunky. still. yeah, I, I could see replaying it if you want to try out the different characters, yeah. but like, again, it's kind of the same thing as the first shining force game where like you could try forcing different characters to work, but I don't think you're really going to get there. Yeah. You got that little turtle flying turtle guy, like little, little, little baby camera. Yeah, whatever. It sounds super Super interesting, but yeah. he never gains HP, so like he gets one shotted by everything. You, you could give him all your HP items, and he, he has high defense. Yeah. So you, if as long as you keep him away from spellcasters, he might do okay. But the problem is, a lot of monsters become spellcasters, yeah. and they could probably easily destroy him. So. But would it be fun to try to make it work? Maybe. 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 I don't know. There's also like it's kind of like Sacred Stones, where like a lot of your classes can up uh, be promoted into two different classes as well, so you could. Yeah. try different things but the problem is with this game there's usually one clear class that's yes. way better than the other yeah. so yeah is it worth it probably not but like if you want to just try shit i mean you can yeah it, I, it might be worth trying the gba game briefly i don't know that i would want to play all the way through but maybe i would try it i would try it if if it if it made it a lot less clunky it might be a more fun game but yeah shining force is one of those because like I have played through most of the NA Fire Emblem games, other than like Shadow Dragon, maybe. Yes. Yeah. Oh, and the and the new Engage one. Yeah. By the way, try Three Houses. It's amazing. Oh, I will. It's it's very much it uh, a Japanese like love building game though. Like I halfway bet. through, so like I you bet. gotta deal with that shit. That's fine. But you like the grindy kind of stuff. That you'll doesn't probably, bother me. You'll in be the slightest. It. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I would like to play the next Shiny Force games. Like, just on my own. We don't want to talk about it or anything. But, like, yeah. Shiny Force CD, I don't think I've ever played a Sega CD game through, like, the first 10 minutes. Th- there's way more good Sega CD games that I need to play. Like, I, I think yeah. I can play them on my, my Mr. if nothing else. Um, I, I need to try it, yeah. And, like, Sega Saturn, that has one, yeah. right? Like, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, I, I think it would be fun. Yeah, it does. It's really expensive. That's... 
Yeah, the uh, Sega CD was Shining Force CD, and Shining Force Three, 3 right? is on the Saturn. Yeah, yes. and then there's like yeah. a PlayStation and a PlayStation Two. Well, those might not be I Shining think. Force. Those might be Shining in the Darkness or some Shining. I think whatever. PS2 has a Shining Force. I, I don't have it written down, but maybe I didn't find it. Uh, uh, the other one I, f- I I found Shining Force Three for the Saturn, and then I found Shining Force Feather for the DS. Hold on here, looking at a list. The, part of the problem there's, is uh, Shining Force Neo. Oh, okay. That's a uh, PlayStation 2. It's not even that expensive. Oh, I might not have been looking for PS2 uh, era, but yeah. I think that might be the last one they made. I yeah, could be completely I, I, wrong I missed there. that one then. I'm looking at a list here. Game Gear, Game Gear, Saturn. That might have been the last one they ever made for okay. Shining Force. Yeah. Because, again, there's a lot of Shining in the Darkness, Shining whatever. Yeah, yeah. There's that, a lot of Shining. That rabbit games. hole goes deep, but. Yeah. I would like to try the Shining Force, you know, the next couple and see. They get progressively better or worse, or yeah, it'd be interesting to try Shining Force Three. I, I'm sure, and Shining Force CD might be worth trying, but I probably I'd be more likely to play those than to replay the others. Yeah, the for other sure. Ones. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I think that's about it. So we both agree that Shining Force Two, hey, for a Sega game, it's one of those. If you're a fan of RPGs, like why not? Yeah, I mean, like I don't I don't know if it gets much better. I don't really know Sega RPGs, but like. Other than Fantasy Star, was it like two, three, and four that are on there? I think. Yeah, I believe so. What else is on there? There's like Shadow Gate. There's right? some or, action. Uh, R- Shadow Gate. There's yeah. some action RPGs. There's what the hell's the name of that one? Uh, it's also on Super Nintendo. I think it's called Shadow something, isn't it? Um, I. It's like not... a post-apocalyptic RPG. Oh yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. I'm forgetting the name. <laughs> anyway. yeah. Yeah, I, I need to try more, but the, there's definitely not as many. And no, so, you, you got to give them credit for for doing a, a good job with this the, with this series. Yeah, definitely worth it. I, I don't. I think we recommend every game that we play today. Pretty. I mean, other than maybe Shining Force One for you, but even I recommend it. So. I, I still think Shining Force One is fi- fine to play once. I say just lower your expectations. You know, I would say the same thing for the for the first the the earlier Fire Emblem games. Yeah. You know. Yeah, for sure they get better. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, go ahead and, uh, <laughs> which Fire Emblem game do you think you're going to play next? Just curious. I, I think I actually am going to play the first NES game. Oh, shit. And okay. I, I may not play far. I may play brief because there's, there's like, what, four different versions of it, it sounds like. Well, how long could it be? I don't think it's very long. Hmm. And and the only question, only question is which of the four, I think, four versions of it there is that I'm going to play, or maybe I'll briefly play all of them and then decide. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to research it a little. I wouldn't mind playing one of the Famicom or the Super Famicom games. Yeah, I, I'm probably gonna play through all the Super Famicom ones at least. Yeah, because uh, those sound uh, interesting at least. Uh, the, like I said, the the NES one is noticeably clunky, and you have to play a translation, and one of the translations was a little better than the other. Uh, you know, fan translations uh, they're hit or miss. Yeah. They can be hit or miss. I, one of them, like I said, seemed noticeably better, and I'll, I'll run with that one. But you know, all right, cool. Thanks, Dave. All right. <laughs>